Welcome to the Deerfield Select Board Board of Health meeting for February 28th, uh, 2023. The time is um, is 5.25 p.m. This is a hybrid meeting. Uh, this meeting would be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation in accordance with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, which extended the governor's March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20, until March 31st, 2023. Uh, please note that while an option for remote attendance or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting or hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcasts unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on the agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. Um, you can go to the Town of Deerfield website, click on the select board um, meeting, and then you can uh, see the um, hyperlink for uh, Zoom meeting, or you can dial in uh, 833, a toll-free number, 833-548-0276. The meeting ID is 911-604-1580. Uh, passcode is 570012. We are uh, having a, a meeting along with a, a joint meeting with the finance committee. Same link supply, same verbiage in the beginning applies for the finance committee and we'll allow, uh, wait for the chair that their meeting starts at 5.30. So select board meeting is now open. Thank you, Trevor. I, uh... And what was on our uh, maybe a little delayed. That's okay. That's fine. We can we can do a few more people for us. So I guess we'll wait till after the meeting and we can have a, a discussion of the old Deerfield wastewater treatment facility path for design, I think is on the agenda. Yeah, we were, I mean, although we have a few minutes, I guess now Julie's here. They're all, they're all coming in and setting up now. So I'll, uh, we'll, we'll meet after their meeting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Trevor. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. Hello. How are you doing? How are you doing? Well, John. Frank. Hi, Jim. Good evening. Hi. How are you? Hello. Hello. Working on this. Yeah. My office is my home. You're still calling this that is going to be twenty two yeah. budget, you know. Oh, do I <laughs> Thank you for saying, you know what, it's the heading in my, um, sure. Okay. And I forget that that even exists. Okay. Did I just fill your seat? You, you know what, you take my seat. Okay. And I will be casual. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 
Yeah, just there. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I have some trying my best to be organized, but I'm not doing very good job. I think it's all yours. I have most of yours. Thank you. Watch it. Yep. Okay, we will take on that with this. No, I think it's okay. And I think I'm going to go to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Emily. Happy snow day. <laughs> it's beautiful. It is. Yeah. And the last snow of the season, I have decided. Uh, uh, no, we got Friday, <laughs> Thursday into Friday. But I'm going to go stir my soup. Maybe that will be the end. Maybe that will be the end. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe. I'm going to go stir my soup. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Did anybody end up in some pages of the Frank and Kevin? I did think I was like, oh, this Thank you. That was the one you were there. There you go. Of all the things I've been Okay, now we're open. Okay. <laughs> okay. You ready? Close ready? Sure. Okay. Um, so we're already recording. So we got to record all our papers. So. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So let's call the Finance Committee meeting to order for February 28th, 2023 at 5 34 p.m. Um, the first item on the agenda is um, you know what? We're going to do a set switch first and then we'll do. Perfect. Minute review. So sounds good. Um, take it away. <laughs> um, which one would you like to start with? Anyone in particular? How about we start with one forty one fifty one hundred. Fifty one hundred. Uh, and that would be your your salary. So your salaries. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the assessor salaries are. Um, we've kept those the same. Okay, so we're looking at one forty one fifty one hundred. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do we have a motion? Oh, did the um, select board, did you guys we come to it already? Okay, good. Yeah. All right, so do we have a motion? Spence? 141, 5100, salaries. 
I move that we recommend the sum of uh, $11,000 for assessor salaries. Second. All right. Any discussion? You kept it the same. Anybody have anything to say? No, we have a motion and a second for $11,000 for assessor's salaries of $141,500 in favor. That's unanimous. What is it, six? Six. Six of us. And then how about if we go to the assessor's admin assistant salary next, and then if you will just go down the line, the next two. Uh, yeah, that's the one you handed out, right? Jesus. Yes, okay, correct. So 141 dollars admin assistant salary. And I know this, um, so it sounds like the districts, the, Karen's been getting stipends, I think, ever since she's been here. Um, and I think those are going to be going through her salary as opposed to, um, you know, just a check directly to her. So okay. I think that's... Stipends for other things. For the fire districts and the water district, yeah, they've, I'm not sure when that started, but I think as long as she's been here, so. So that 7% increase includes that stipend. Right, right. But it's like, it's money that comes in and goes back out. So right. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. How does it come in? The districts will give the checks to the town and then. Yeah, we talked about this. That you know, a lot of the positions yep. that get stipends from other bodies mm -hmm. are lumping in with the town revenues and then paying out of salaries because it, it helps them with taxes. They're not doing right. self employment. Right, I understand. If it comes back in, though, should it be a line item? There's no cost to us. Um, It'll still be part of our salary. Does it show the revenue? It will, yes. Yeah. And so when we go through the revenues, it'll be in revenue. Okay. That I increased a okay. uh, line item for that. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. I just had a question. Does this count towards the re retirement? Yes, that's correct. Which is part of the reason that we had recommended doing this was so that. Um, this will now be in the W-2. It will count towards their retirement. They won't have to pay the exorbitant um, taxes on it and such. So it increases what we have to pay in retirement, but not by a ton. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is a 5.5% increase, which is, with, I mean, if you don't count that extra stipend, which is in line with the class comp. Right. Yeah. We have we don't have a motion yet. They like to make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve assessor's admin assistant salary account one forty one five one one zero for seventy four thousand three hundred twenty two dollars. Second. Any discussion? No. no. Any other discussion? Any questions? Comments? All those in favor. That's unanimous. Zero zero. Two seconds. Okay. That. Let's say twenty eight. All right. So the assessor's expense one forty one dash fifty four hundred. Yeah. This one we did not make. Um, we made a few small adjustments. Yeah, yeah. I think all, I think all downward too. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Postage went down like $350 for the year. We have a motion. I move that we recommend the sum of $18,525 for assessor's expense account number 14154. Second. I'll second. <clears throat> Do you have the, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> How much have we spent so far this year? I think it was 14, 14 or 15. 
Are we on track for spending for this year? I think they probably have. Well, a lot of your expenses are probably at the beginning of the year, or right? Yeah, typically. A lot of, yeah. yeah. So I'd say yes. Okay. <laughs> Anybody have questions or discussion? No? All those in favor? It's unanimous, 600. Zero, zero. Okay, and then the last one of their budgets is the quinquennial recertification 142-5400. This one did go down a little bit. We uh, have a new contract for this quinquennial um, for this five-year period. And I believe it's 19500 a year. And then we added um, 2500 a year to that for personal property. Um, which they don't include in their contract. So it did go down. Hopefully the service doesn't go down with the cost. I don't know. We'll see. We have a motion. Uh, I move that we recommend the sum of $22,000 for quinquennial recertification. Second. You get to say quinquen. <laughs> Can I add a comment or ask yeah, a question of, of the assessors? So this particular account, um, each year you request to have, not, no, I shouldn't say every year, but the last couple of years you've requested for the carry forward um, to, to be encumbered, the, the amount that's left at the end of the year. And my understanding from talking to Karen was that there were additional um, things that were requested of Patriot from previous years that didn't get done because of the pandemic. So that that will be used this year. Is that what your intent is? That's the intent. Yeah, we actually have a, I believe, a bill that we're holding that it was it's probably four months old now that we haven't paid because we're they haven't quite completed um, what they were supposed to do. So yeah, my expectations are you know next year we should get caught up and back in line. Great. That, so. Okay. That was my understanding, but I just wanted yeah. to make sure the finance committee was um, good with that too, because I, I know that question was asked, asked the other the night. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Yeah. Okay. It's been moved and seconded for 142.5400 at $22,000. All those in favor? <laughs> Council says, uh, sit somewhere where I can see everybody. Um, that's unanimous, 600. So we had a couple other questions that weren't related to your budgets that we forwarded, just sort of general assessor mm -hmm. stuff that we've talked about in the passing. So I think I emailed that to you, right? You I think you did. I don't remember. Okay. No. So, okay. so one question was, We've been looking at the financial indicators and we got off the ML, the DLS website, the new growth for last year. And there's this big new growth in personal property. Do you know, not the dollar value, but like what kind of stuff falls into that personal property increase? Um, utility companies are a big one. So anything underground or like high tension like lines, lines, power or lines, or yeah. Cable, okay. Cell phone towers, um, anything that's not real estate basically that's taxable. Um, okay. I know True Corp did a lot of work up at their, up in the East Airfield. Um, so machinery and equipment's exempt so for manufacturing? Yes, machinery and equipment is, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> but, so I think a lot of it in the last few years has been utility, utility work. Oh. Treehouse? Uh, I don't know about personal property. I would imagine there's some there. Um, I don't know how much. Do they brew there? Are they brewing? I think a very little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, so, but, uh, another question was, do you have an opinion on projected new growth for next year? We've been pretty healthy the past few years. Like we've had a lot of commercial and industrial and residential. And have you gotten any indication about going forward? 
there's not a lot going on other than I think, well, new pro is building, right? But I, yep. we don't know where they'll be July 1st. I don't know, you know, how far they'll be into their process. Um, of course, they have a TIP yeah. agreement. Mm -hmm. So that'll cut that. And I think the way that works, it'll actually, we should discuss this more maybe in the future before we do another TIP agreement. I believe this will actually affect new growth almost like permanently, if that makes sense, because of the TIF. Am I? Oh, I wish I knew more yeah. about that. I don't. We were discussing well, that. I don't know if anybody has any. I think Carolyn. Carolyn, do you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say what it does is it sets uh, a certain value. So um, we know what the value is ahead of time for, you know, five years out for sure. Hmm. But once the agreement's over, does it go back to the actual assessment? Yes, it's the actual assessment. Oh, it's not well, it does, but then it depreciates, it depreciates right over time. time. So by the time after the 10 years is up, you yeah. know, like, so I, I don't know what the effect would be, but it'll be something. Um, as far as other new growth, I don't think there's a lot of, uh, you know, condo projects have done. That's good we haven't seen a lot of big permit come in you know for a lot of new construction okay that'll be somewhat okay. limited this year could someone unpack the acronym tip tax incentive financing agreement sorry tax incentive financing agreement thank you mm -hmm. so the new growth, though, is based on what's happened since the last valuation. So we're talking from January to January, right? Or are we talking from July 1 to um, June 30th? Do you know that? I believe July to June. Okay. So some of those condos sold since the last. Yeah, but. Right. But they were partially complete. Yeah, I mean, there might be a few left over. Okay. Uh, but I think the majority of them were done, you know, completed. So, okay. Before July 1st, even though they sold after. You see so, some come through. Yeah, they, they just, it won't be too, too much, I don't think. All right. So maybe I've been a little too robust in my projections, but it's still quite a bit less than what we had last year. So. Mm -hmm. What is your projection? Yeah. 170, where we had 280 some this year, right? And 213,000 the year before. So I thought that was a reasonable, do you think? Trying to get it, trying to get it as close as possible to what we think might be so that in the fall, we're not making so many adjustments to get the tax recap done. Right. My thought is it's going to be less, but I don't, I don't know. Okay. And Karen wasn't really too sure last time we right. met either. So, okay. Hopefully it'll be closed, but it might be a little less. Okay. Well, that could be absorbed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, how is required overlay calculus? I feel like I'm like doing a test or something. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's not a true or false. Required overlay, or I don't know if it's required. Was um, that the question? Is we were a little confused about what the question was. So I, I think we estimate overlay based so, on there are quite a lot of large um, back to the utility companies. The state changed their methodology for um, valuing the utility companies. So those have gone up a lot in the last couple of years because of that. And in turn, the utility companies are appealing Mm. you know their assessments and filing abatements which basically every town that they have property in so i don't know where it will go but those are pretty large numbers out there that so we're... so i think what we we're talking about is we have this revenue detail sheet and um we add up all the things we want to come in and then we subtract something for overlay and it was Last year was sixty five thousand that we subtracted for overlay. I guess for or that, no, this year, the, I just this year's. I threw something in there here again, not so really knowing. We we're wondering how we estimate what we want to hold back for overlay. 
Do you guys do that? <laughs> just, yeah. Do you that? It's kind of hard, hard to know until the time comes for the tax recap, isn't it? Right? Or Yeah. And I think it's a percentage, and I think it's a historical percentage, but I'd have to go back and look at the methodology. Okay. So let me know if my 65000 is anywhere close in the ballpark. Yeah, we could follow up on it. Okay. Thank you. And then the nonprofit question. Um, so is it possible to look at non, like if nonprofit, if nonprofits own property and the property isn't being used for the purpose of the nonprofit, um, is it still tax exempt? Not supposed, no. not supposed to be. Not supposed to be. So no. do we review the properties that are we meaning you um, <laughs> <laughs> to review those properties and like assess them or not assess them i mean the they way. basically tell us what's happening with the properties i, mean, I don't know you know if they hold one class or i'm not sure exactly what i don't think they need to do too much to have it qualify um but again they tell us what they're doing with the properties and then we kind of have to go, you know, kind of go with that. With okay. Area. And it's from the, um, like the nonprofit tells you what yeah. the, um, so, and you can go back and nag them, I assume. <laughs> I, I think there should be some regular review. That's my problem with, yeah. the, with the system that we currently have. There should be, yeah, that'll, yeah, we'll have to discuss. How that would look or how it, you know how it would work okay um, I, yeah because i mean I, I imagine some properties if they you know maybe are taxes in one year are they actually the next you know i don't know i don't think the nonprofits are going to come to us each year and volunteer <laughs> right by the way so, we're not using this so we can do that. yeah okay. should that be reviewed yes um i guess that's a Question of how how we'll do it, mm -hmm. you know, how the process will work. So, so yeah, we can we can definitely look into that and see. Maybe by next year we'll have an answer. <laughs> we'll save our questions for next year. <laughs> Anybody else have a like, general assessor question to that? What they do and how it works. Oh, does property assessments um, go up? Uh, do, does property have to be sold for its assessment to change or do you reassess? No. Okay. No. Um, sales are part of the process. So, in sales, you know, sales have been occurring the last few years, they have been going up quite substantially. So, that does in turn, you know, mean a usually a larger assessment for higher assessment for most properties. Um, it which in turn, you know, means a lower tax rate typically if the assessment goes way up, you know, overall. But not necessarily a lower tax bill, but lower tax rate. <laughs> yeah. Quick question. Yeah, right. Jerry didn't mention when does the um, when do they actually owe a tax on a higher? I mean, they've got the lot, and then they build a house on it, and then they, someone buys it. When, when it when in that process is it assessed at a sort of full value? As soon as like, the building is complete. So it's an occupancy permit, whatever you call it, from the building inspector. Yeah, and it's actually partially assessed, right? Like it's a percentage of completion, right? Yeah. So throughout, so if they're taking a lot of time, it's correct. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Curious process. Mm -hmm. Tim, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, several questions. Um, new pros valuation as they build. What's the process for you to go out and assess how much you know has been done in a particular year? So if it takes two years to build it, how do you make those uh, interim evaluations? And uh, that's Patriot Properties will will do that for us. We'll make you know regular inspections. 
And so the uh, the TIP agreement affects, like, say, the first year they they did a million dollars worth of improvements, so they get their their first um, rebate or or exemption that year. The next year they finish the project, so they get a really big exemption that year. Is that how the process works? Yes, yeah, sounds like you have it right. Yeah. Okay, and. Um, Going back to the nonprofits, um, is there some uh, state statute that covers this that uh, you are able to share with us in your research? State statute. I'm not sure I understand. Well, so in other words, if, if, if state law says that uh, a nonprofit doesn't have to pay taxes on property if its primary use is education or whatever, but something that houses uh, uh, an administrator, for instance, has really no educational. So, you know, what are the parameters, in other words, that would trigger um, nonprofit owned property to remain taxable? I think, I think we'd have to get back to you on that yeah. one. Yep, good. Because uh, there must be some law. Oh, there definitely yes. is. Yeah. Yeah. There is, there is a definition. And if it's not in their mission statement, like an educational use, then it can go back on the tax roll. And the final thing, I, I sent Chuck an email and I didn't have Frank's and, and your skip uh, town emails, so I didn't include you, but um, <clears throat> we've been given some advice about raising the valuations on some town property. So um, that would be something that we'd be interested in getting some feedback on in the next month or so, if that's possible. Yeah, actually we added it to our, our next meeting's agenda. Excellent, thank you. Did, was there a reason for increasing the value? Like, was... So um, maybe Julie can speak to this better so you're in the same room, but um, it has to do with, you know, public bidding processes and what work can be done before you trigger certain requirements. Um, you know, the Julie, or can you help me out here? <laughs> sure. Um, if you do repairs, this is my non building expert opinion or comment, right? Um, if you do repairs to a building above a certain percentage of the value of building, then you have to make the building come up to code in all of the accessibility, fire suppression, et cetera. So if we want to do a relatively small amount of work on a building, but the building's um, value hasn't been upgraded recently, then that small amount of work triggers us into that much larger commitment. Would it be worth having a regular appraisal done for each property? Possibly, or? yeah. I don't. I don't know that we can just. I mean, I. Yeah, I'd have to check. Cross out the number. Yeah, I don't know if we can do that. Um, but so we're, the appraisals are done by Patriot Properties, is that? And they look at the town buildings and everything too. Yeah, I don't know how close closely. Yeah. So that doesn't affect how much money comes in, right? You know, insurance costs might go up if anything. I don't know, but I'm wondering if a an appraisal would be a better method to. I don't know. We'll have we'll we'll discuss that and. Okay. Yeah. We'll try to come up with an answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks. Patriot Properties, where are they in uh, the budget, Brenda? Are they contractor when, services? When we pay them, it's for, for the quinquennial recertification. That's where that, sure. that, that last one that we voted on. Oh, so the that's them. 22, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. Patriot. Anybody else have any questions? No, nope. I'm online. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't work too late. <laughs> you either. Thanks, guys. I think you passed. Sorry. No, they didn't. They didn't mean to That's why we're doing it. Tonight. Oh, really? Oh. Let's do minutes and then we'll do a uh, place. I'm going to leave you. <laughs> 
Okay. We have um, like to make a motion for the minutes. Uh, make a motion to approve the minutes of the. Oh, you want to get what's the date of the meeting? Twenty third. Okay. Meeting. Last meeting February twenty third. 2023. Second. All right. Any discussion? Okay. Okay. Let's um start with police payroll. And I don't know if you, did you hand out that to everybody? Not yet. No, nope, but I will. I'll let you, or if you want to give it to me, I can hand it out to everyone. So it's 210 51 it should be like six of them. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. John's given you more than what you'd ask for. Yes and no. These were some of the questions that I got in advance of the meeting, and I just wanted to take the time to fairly and accurately address them. Do you have one Thanks. Final, John? I do, absolutely. Yep. Great. So we either can flip through the packet or first, or we can go through the budget lines and... Let's do the packet first. Let's sure. Go so good evening, most know. My name is John Pachork. I serve as the Chief of Police in Deerfield, now approaching 11 years in the position. So this will be my 14th budget that uh, I've either worked on or been involved in. And one of the questions I got in advance of the meeting was our call statistics. So what I did was uh, on the first page of the packet that I provided, both Carolyn and Tim, I saw that you guys were remoting in. I emailed it to you both about five minutes before I walked over here. So it should be in your email if you'd like to follow along. Thank you, John. In 2020, in 2021, and 2022, the call numbers are right there for your review. The calls in 2020 were about 14,284 calls for service. In 21, there were 13,279. In 22, there were 13,641. You can see the average calls a day is anywhere from 36 to 39. However, the calls don't take into account the phone calls we get, the walk-ins into the lobby, the renewals for license to carry, or any of the side stuff we do. This is just somebody either at the dispatch center or the mobile data terminal putting in a domestic or an area check or a medical call, or it's actually them out there doing something in the field. So there probably could be another one to 2,000 added to this on the side, but I'm not a big person for, for doctoring numbers. I just, it is what it is. So there's the calls. You can kind of flip through them at your own convenience. Page two of my packet. One of the questions that we always get is the staffing for the police department. We staff two officers 24 seven. There's an officer primarily assigned to South Deerfield. There's an officer assigned to Old Deerfield, which encompasses obviously Old Main Street. It also encompasses East Deerfield, which is the River Road side in West Deerfield, because there's a big travel time disparity between those. So there's a North car and there's a South car. When we look at how many people it takes to run the police department, you'll see that 365 days a year at 48 hours brings a total personnel time of 17,520 hours. Now your average worker that works Monday through Friday in an office works 40 hours a week. We usually factor them in for a work schedule of about 2,080 hours. Police officers work a four and two schedule by contract. So they work four days on, two days off. That gives them off about 16 additional days per year, rotating weekends. So sometimes they're on day, uh, during the week, sometimes they're working weekends for two, three weeks in a row. Every six weeks, they get a full weekend off. That's the whole point of the four and two schedule. Vacation, with the senior people we have, we average about 160 hours of vacation time, personal holiday, and training. So the factor that I used here was 1,624 hours of active patrol time for a full-time officer. When you divide the 1,624 into the 17,520, it yields a total full-time equivalency of 10.78 bodies. We also know that we have a school resource officer that 90% of the year is working with the vast 
majority of kids within the community, whether it's schools or programs, even in the summer. You have myself um, next month with the criminal justice reform and less part-time people. I'm actually going back to patrol three quarters of the time myself. And then we have a task force officer assigned to the regional anti-crime task force, and they do reimburse us a certain amount of money, um, you know, that Brenda certainly can say, you know, that we see on an average monthly basis. So when we look at the police department to fully staff it, it's about 13.78 bodies right now. And depending whether I'm on patrol or doing administrative work or any variation in between, that number could drop down to 13. On the next page, these are the amount of part-time shifts we have staffed. And I had them go back and I had them analyze the schedule for the past five years and count every single part-time shift worked. Some of these are filling in for vacations. Some are filling in for investigations. I don't like assigning full-time folks sexual assaults to do investigations that take 80 to 120 hours and paying them overtime. So what I'll do is I'll backfill their full-time shifts. I'll assign them the sexual assault and a part-time person's working their shift. Now they're not on an eve shift. They're not on a midnight. They're working a day shift. They're following up on that sexual assault, doing the SANE interview, it's et cetera, et cetera. And it's much more cost-effective. So over the past five years, you can see that we average anywhere from 60, 62, 56, 68 part-time shifts a month, just kind of average. And when you factor those in, I gave you the totals for the year, and then I gave you the full-time equivalency of the bodies. So most go, okay, John, why is this important? Why, why are you giving us this data? I'm giving you this data because as of December 31st, 2020, we signed the Justice and Equity Act. The Justice and Equity Act eliminated the part-time police academy. We are losing part-time cops. Most of my part-time cops are now senior people. They're 60, 65, 68, 72. Uh, I do have one person left that's 25. One. That's it. I used to hire about three brand new part-time cops a year. We would train them up. We'd pay them 20 bucks an hour. They were eager. They were hungry. They would work anything. Midnights, weekends, holidays, Christmas, no big deal. We're now coming into a new time where there is no part-time academy. In order to be a police officer in Massachusetts, you have to go to a full-time police academy. And that's highly problematic, at least for the small communities. On the next page, I gave you a police officer vacancy timeline. <clears throat> We have one full-time cop that we lost yesterday to the State Police Academy. We have one part-time police officer that we lost yesterday to the State Police Academy. I have another full-time police officer right now that's in the final hiring process with the federal government. In order to hire a non-certified cop, we can look at lateral transfers, we can look at outside folks, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to describe to you the same way I did with Senator Comerford. If I asked you as a business representative, if you had a vacancy within your company and you could not backfill that vacancy to 12 to 18 months, what would it do for your company? Do you backfill it with overtime? Do you let a position go vacant? Do we run with one cruiser on in Deerfield? We know we have 5,000 people. We know the private schools bring in an additional 3,000. We know the businesses in this town bring in an additional service populace of five thousand people that one police officer is responsible for anywhere from seven to 14,000 people. This timeline, I want to run you through it quick. Assuming there's a vacancy and we don't have somebody to hire, we would immediately post the position. But we also know that we'd want that position posted for two, three, four weeks before we actually go through the, the criteria and figure out who we want to interview. Assuming we set up interviews week five and six, we do a conditional offer of appointment week seven through 10, not a big deal. As part of the conditional offer of appointment, we do a physical abilities test, which is required by the state. We then do the Cooper standards. They are two different fitness exams that are required to get in and pass the police academy. We do a medical exam, an extensive background, and a psychological exam on that person. And the reason I put seven to 10 weeks is sometimes things are backed up. You cannot schedule a psychological exam and get it done in a week or two. It takes time. The biggest challenge we have is the full-time police academy. 
because a full-time police academy could have started three weeks earlier, or there could be one starting at seven weeks. Here's the challenge. They usually close the application. The deadline is about 10 to 12 weeks before the start date. So let's say there's one starting at seven weeks. It's already full and the deadline's closed. There's three in Western Mass a year. The full-time academy is then 20 weeks. On top of that, once they get out, they've really never even seen the street before. So now we put them through a two-month field training officer program. Really to take somebody from outside of policing, introduce them to policing, and bring them up to a full-time academy is going to take us anywhere from 12 to 18 months to backfill one individual. And if we're backfilling two positions, then the question becomes is how do we staff those shifts? It turns into an utter nightmare. I've addressed this with legislature. I've addressed it with the governor's office. I've addressed it with mass chiefs. I've spoken at MIAA conferences about this. It is not easy. This act was the equivalent of eliminating licensed practitioner nurses and making everybody be an RN. It was the equivalent of eliminating basic EMTs and saying, every person in this Commonwealth will be a paramedic. It's highly challenging, not only for Deerfield, but imagine even smaller. One of the next questions I got on an email in advance was what we have for detail fees. So on the next page, you'll see the detail fees charged. In 2022, we had a sum that we took in of $32,754. What that encompasses, every time you see a cruiser on a detail, we charge $10 an hour. That is the maximum reimbursement rate that Mass DOT will pay us in accordance with their standards. So $10 an hour, if a cruiser sits out there for eight hours, we get $80. We then charge a 10% administration fee, which is allowed by law. However, the law exempts state and local projects. So when they redid five and 10 with a multi-million dollar project, we could not charge any part of the 10% fee on that. So you see 2021, when they re redid five and 10, we got 33,000. The vast majority of that was the detail cruiser sitting out there at $10 an hour and other companies. Verizon and Eversource, we can charge the 10%. Mass DOT and other projects, we cannot. So do they, they pay um, salary also or just- They pay the salary the also, yes. Okay. Yep, this pay, includes the salary or- this, this is on top of the salary. Okay. This goes right into the general fund. Nothing to do with the police department. This is certified into free cash by our amazing finance director. So yeah, all this goes right back into the town general fund. We have a revolving fund that we pay the cops out every two weeks with payroll. We pay the details out. We bill the companies immediately. And as the money comes in, that account goes back up. So throughout the year, it fluctuates. And every 60 days or so, you and Deb probably balance it. We do. Yep. Yep. This, is that generally overtime for the officers? No, it's a set detail rate. Yep. It's a set detail rate, but yep. it's in addition to their 4-2 rotation. Yes, right. Okay. yes. Right. And yep. strictly that revolving fund is an in and out. We pay them, the company reimburses them. So. Yep. What about like payroll taxes, Social Security, the things that are part of payroll? Are we billing the people that are using so the town's eating that? Yep, that's part of this. That would be part of this 32,000 that we'd have to eat. And I don't know what that number is, but yeah. I don't, I don't either offhand. Hmm? Yeah. Is it, is it 10, what is the $10 you mentioned? Uh, that's for a cruiser per hour. And then there's an administrative fee that, that gets charged on that, which he said is 10%. You can't do it for anything that has to do with DOT. Right, so, so, so we're getting an hourly rate reimbursed to pay the officer the detail, fee, plus you're getting ten dollars an hour that goes into this. Fund. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, presumably that fund is designed to some of those payroll or extra expenses that the town is incurring that are not being reimbursed for. I would think we'd more cover it out of free no, cash the, as a balance. Yeah. For the ten percent, the, the fund itself just handles the the payroll cost for that employee. And the reimbursement from the from the uh, company that we're servicing. So so that's a wash. But you're right. The Medicare taxes, 
um, really be just Medicare. Retirement? Um, no. retirement. Retirement's not eligible. Oh, you're right. It isn't. No. Overtime and details cannot count legally on retirement. They changed it in 1982. Okay. Not that far back. I listened to the old guys complain about it. And I'm they sure will cite did. the date. Oh, yeah. You're <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and if that Medicare number's high, let me know. No, so it's, it's 1.45% of, you know, let's say, what do we do for details in a period of a year? I don't even know. I couldn't even tell you. What about Social Security? One year, 459000 so We don't pay Social Security. We don't. Uh, doesn't, doesn't no. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. No, because we are on state retirement system through Franklin County Retirement. Oh, yeah, we yeah, don't right. pay into Social Security. Yeah. Yeah. So there's roughly 3,000 hours of details were performed in 2022. No, because we wow. never use that because we can't charge when a cruiser's not there. And we can't charge the 10% admin fee when they're on a state or local job. So that number would be nowhere close to accurate. There's years that we've done $900,000 worth of details. I was, I was and we can say only million, but... charge that admin fee on so much of it. Yeah. Is there always a cruiser? Involved? No. No. And believe me, 10 to 15 years ago, you couldn't get a cruiser on a detail if you had to. Now with distracted driving, every company is asking for one. It's ungodly. So when I found out Mass DOT, if you look back in 2019, I found out Mass DOT increased it from 5 to $10 an hour. It took me about an hour to change that number as well. No, yeah. Not, I'm, are there any details where there is not a cruise involved? Like I, I, a lot. Uh, maybe DA football game. Yes. You know. Yep. There's a but, lot. Yep. But how do what do we get just payroll back? We get just the payroll back, right? Correct. Yes. So I just figured Medicare on a million dollars and it's fourteen thousand five hundred. Yep. All good questions. There's a yep. set detail rate? Yes. Yep. For construction projects? Yes. Calls. Okay. So, for instance, you mentioned the VA football game. That's pretty it's cool. all one rate. Yeah. The detail one rate. rate's one rate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a set rate for regular hours and then overtime hours yes. are beyond eight hours. It goes into overtime. Yeah. Um, we've encouraged John in the past to keep the cruisers, if they're half limping along, um, for detail cruisers. And the reason why. Um, is because the the cost of trying to keep them running a bit more or to hang on to them from a safety point of view for our officers is really worth it. Because with distracted driving, you know, you see a police officer, people aren't really paying attention, but when they see the police cruiser lights, they pay more attention. And so from to injury, just from the, sh I mean, obviously we don't want our officers hurt. I mean, that's the driving force behind my pushing for this, but from a just from a liability point of view and 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 job job um, trying to backfill someone that's hurt, you know it, it pays for itself. If you're just looking from a bottom line point of view to hang on to our cruisers for a little bit, good. And then, uh, oh, go ahead, Dave. No, no. You I guess we're gonna get, we'll get a chance to go back and ask you questions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the next thing I wanted to do is, is I always try and keep the police department in check with what's happening across the Commonwealth. Public safety fees across the Commonwealth range anywhere from 6 to 12% is the norm. Your higher communities are 12% of the total town operating budget. And on the lower side, they can be as low as 6%. Some even go as low as 3 or 4% in the the tiny, tiny towns that literally the police budget's $30,000 a year. So what I did for you was I divided in general the total police budget with expenses, payroll, and the cruiser in here, and the total town operating budget, and figured roughly, I didn't look at revenues, I didn't look at personnel costs, because they kind of counterbalance each other out, that ultimately the police department is at about a dollar six per thousand of the 15 15, I think it's 15, 15 is the 15, 17 is the tax rate. Yeah. So the police department is roughly a dollar six. Fire districts 102, water's a dollar, and old Deerfield fire is 56 cents. And then what I did was just threw some home numbers out for you guys. So you can see what you pay towards policing services. No part of this was meant to be anything ill. 
It was just to tell you that ultimately, when you're looking at that massive bill twice a year, that what's going towards police. Now, this isn't a biannual. This is once a year. Yep. So mm -hmm. it just kind of breaks it into perspective. That's all. Seems to me it tells me you should talk to the assessors about your stuff. Yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like I'm saving like this. Meeting with the assessors. <laughs> I know my total's like 12 grand. Don't <laughs> remind me. Oh my God. <laughs> So those are just to answer some of the quick questions I got from Julie and, and probably the committee in advance of the meeting. I'm happy to entertain anything, or I'm happy to just to start going right through uh, payroll and expenses as we go. Happy to answer anything. The biggest challenge we have now is moving forward in the most cost-effective manner without part-time cops. It's it's not going to be easy. So can, let me ask you a question about that. that one. Um, so what you're saying is now the the, the law doesn't allow part time cops, or it doesn't, or it makes you have to have part time cops who are full time certified. Full -time certified, okay. yes. And so that's why I think I've seen things either in the paper or in these details or laws that were passed to help preserve some of your our uh, part time officers who are more senior, who are maybe early in their retirement. Yes. Part. Okay. Yeah, we've done a couple age waivers on a couple of our guys that are between 60 and 65. Okay. Yeah. And then there's another thing maybe I didn't understand about policing, but are you telling me that when you put post for a police officer job, the people who apply are not police officers? In you know, the future, words, they will not be. Right now, the possibility of us getting somebody that already had the part-time academy sitting in the background yeah. is possible. In the future, this is to let you know that that cliff is coming. Okay. And it's not going to be easy. Because when you lay out this timeline, it makes it seem like you're getting somebody who's brand new who has to then go to the academy. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna you're and you're hiring people before they're out of the academy or a conditional basis. Yes. Yeah. So in order to get into the police academy, they have to have a sponsorship by a community. Right. So it's not even like that a kid can graduate Westfield State College and say, Hey, I want to jump into the academy yeah. and get ahead of this. And that way a community goes. All right, this person's already 28 weeks into yeah. the academy. Like, let's grab them. Yeah. They can't do that. A community has to sponsor them. We have to give them a cruiser to take to the emergency vehicle operation course, a department firearm for a week, on and on and on. So you can use part-time cops, but they have to be full-time certified. So let's say I go down to Westfield State College or I partner with Greenfield Community College and try and grab some of those local folks. We used to stick them in a part-time police academy give them 400 hours of part-time training. Then we'd stick them out in the field and we'd take three, four a year. And when there was a full-time vacancy, we'd go, this one's got the best personality, the best work ethic. They treat the residents like a diamond. This is the one we want. Now it's going to be challenging. It's just going to be more challenging. Okay. And, and you're essentially saying that right now you have... I'm sorry, 2022. So about 3.6 FTEs of part-time. Yes. Quotes yes. That you that we have paid. Yes. Okay. So, um, why are we? Why is there not like just sort of a constant um, job posting for police officers to get them in the pipeline? Because part-time, I pay them 20 to 25 dollars an hour. Full-time, they're making $30 an hour plus benefits. So a full-time police officer with benefits is going to cost us $80,000 a year. Yeah. To backfill those shifts with a part-time person is yeah. costing Brenda and I 40. So okay. I'm cheap. So we've been we've been getting we've by. We've been getting by for the past cheap. 40 years. Okay. And, and then, this is not me. This is Mike Wasp before me. Sure. No, no, no. Yep, no. yep. I'm just trying to get yep. a yeah. And then um, what sort of overtime... Is, does the budget tell us? I'm sorry. If I should there is an overtime line in there. Yeah. I did slightly increase it when we go through payroll from, I think, 27 to 40,000 yeah. to account for right. some of the future. Do we have a, an FTEs? <laughs> no, we don't. Okay. Full-time is more for arrests or they're held over for um, weather and shift coverage for accidents or something like that. My overtime is usually pretty low. Yeah. Yep. Per pay averages, six to 900 is kind of the norm. Per pay? I'd say so. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
What's that mean? It's six, that- six to nine hundred dollars for every two weeks so uh, for overtime. It seems like a when you do have overtime, often it's um, chargeable towards the CIT grant or to um, something else. Mm-hmm. So he's he's very good at controlling his overtime. Okay. Well, and there's no suggestion. Yeah, he's not. I'm, no, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Yeah. So I guess another I'm trying to think about it. What what is the overall overtime budget expended? How much money have we spent on overtime? Expended or, or per, budgeted? Per, per, no, how much have we spent, for instance, in the last fiscal year? Oh, I, don't I don't know. I, I don't have it. that number in front of me, but it's budgeted for twenty seven thousand, and I'm usually well under that. So I guess I didn't understand the six to nine hundred dollars per pay period. Is- yeah. So when you times that times twenty eight pay periods in a year, I thought you meant um, officers. Sorry. No, you're for fine. Officers. No, you're all right. Yeah, yeah. It is so, for officers. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. So every two weeks between yeah, all it, guess, the police officers, it's usually it's averages six to nine hundred. Yep. Between them all. Between them all, and that yeah, can include okay. court time, trials. Yep. Minimal yep. overtime. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm cheap. No, John's just very good. So is there any talk about regionalization? There is. We uh, we brought in a full consultant and study through the Franklin Regional Council of Governments back in 2015. Um, a, a report was produced, and ultimately it was found that our budget would increase. There would be substantial uh, disadvantages for the town of Deerfield to regionalize because our services would be pulled away to other communities if we did so. So we always can look at regionalization and we always can look at shared services. Regionalization always works when you have downtime and a ton of duplicious resources. When you have three departments that all have detectives and one detective is only functioning at 45%, another's at 32%, and another's at 50%, we kind of can take one of those detectives and eliminate them and create just two on a combined agency. It's hard for a town like Deerfield to go from minimum manning of one north car and one south car to minimizing anything less. We're kind of operating almost bare bones. Your chief of police next month is going back out on patrol. So regionalization is great when you have a vast variety of resources that you can combine and you can kind of minimize and cut the budgets back slightly and use all those resources to your advantage. When you're running minimum manning to begin with, uh, it's not as easy to show. And the consultant came in here in front of the Sunderland, Waitley, and Deerfield Select Board. And point blank, I, I literally asked him right on camera about cost savings. And he said, if you're going into this with a cost savings mentality, you are going to fail. This is not going to save you money. And if I'm saying anything wrong, please correct me at any time. No, it's the level of service goes up, um, but obviously regionalization would also cost more when you have a level of service. And when we talk about level of service, is not so much here in Deerfield, but the level of service in the in Whateley and Sunderland would go up. Um, and I mean, we we do backup already um, and mutual aid, but if you regionalize you know, you're bringing up the services that are available and there's no savings in that. Is is that because um, the staffing and level of service in the other communities is lower than Deerfield? Yes. And there was an unwillingness to, exp- to raise their level of service to Deerfield's level? I wouldn't say there's an unwillingness. It was just- Inability? Inability to go forward, yes. There, I mean, nobody, nobody just really has that money at the moment. Right. Whatever. Go ahead, Jim. Um, so, your, am, am I understanding it correctly then that with the end of part-time officers, at some point in the medium future, we're going to be looking at adding more full-time officers. We are, unfortunately, that was the whole crux of this. Yeah, that's what I. Thought. Yeah, it was kind I of. Thought you were dancing around. No, it was. It was kind of like the cliff is coming, and and it's not pretty. And I've addressed it with legislature, and and I think even honestly, Senator Comerford um, is, I think very concerned about this and its impact on the small communities. Joe has, you know 
raised several support for me in the cause to re-entertain this and figure out how we can address this. And we're, uh, she and I are passing ideas back and forth and going to be setting up meetings with uh, the highest level of state government. And uh, this is not just me. There are probably well over 50 communities in Western Mass that actually look at me as the spearhead in leader of this. I remember you mentioned at one point that some towns were seriously considering just giving up having police departments. They're going to have to, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. That's, what's, that's what's why it's so, um, I mean, they, your backup is the state police, but the state police don't have the personnel either. So um, it's it's really a, Joe, Joe gave us 100,000 the first year of this um, as an earmark to defray some of the costs countywide, which is really a drop in the bucket. But even since then, we've not had even any earmarks to defer the costs at all. So, I mean, so, it's not like the state governor has, government has completely given up. It's just, you know, people haven't been able to protest enough that there's any action to fix it. So, if, okay, let's just cut to the chase then. How many positions are you expecting to have to add? I think we're going to have to get extremely creative. I think one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to keep recruiting retired cops from the area. Deerfields often um, acknowledge us the Long Meadow of Franklin County, and people like to work here. They like the community. They like the location. Deerfield has a great balance between busy policing and downtime where they can actually grab a coffee in between calls and wave to residents. So it's a fine balance between they're entertained enough on calls, they have enough calls where they're not bored, but yet they're not out of control either. And there are communities out there that they are call to call to call. And if I stuck you in a cruiser for a shift or two, you'd go, oh my God, people do this. So uh, Dave, just on a side note, uh, overtime last year was 27,950. We spent 26,091. So 27,950, we spent 26,091, and the turn back was 1858 in overtime. Just on a side note. So it's going to be a challenge. I'm going to keep recruiting retired folks and hope that at least 10, 20, 30 shifts a month we can fill. Midnights are always the hardest. Nobody wants to work midnights. Nobody wants to work Christmas. Nobody wants to work New Year's. Now, remember, on top of all this, Deerfield is a destination in a tourist community. Every single weekend, there's something going on. So this isn't just about, hey, staffing two cruisers. Like if you drive through town on the weekend and all of a sudden by an event, you're like, oh my God, there's seven Deerfield cops there. No matter what, this is going to be hard. It's going to require us to take a step back and reevaluate year to year to year. Yeah. How's the Greenfield Police Department affecting you, the changes they're going through? They shut down four hours tonight. And I've made it well known that we are not responding to service calls up there. We will back up state police. We will back up their fire department. We, unless it is a life safety matter, are not covering a community that has 32 full-time cops and a $4.6 million budget. Not happening. That's been well known to them from me. That is not Deerfield's responsibility. If there's a life safety event, our people will absolutely go. If state police request backup, we will absolutely back them up at any point in time. But in good faith, I can't sit back with 32 police officers in a four something million dollar operating budget and say, hey, you want to shut down for four hours a night? We're going to send people to cover your calls. That's not happening. And I think I made that known in the Greenfield report. Do you get any, is it just a Mutual back scratching thing, or yes. do they actually yeah, pay you anything? There's no financial whatsoever. It's just a uh, a mutual aid agreement where if we need backup, they come over here. If we have a violent domestic, Sunder Little slide over. State police is often listening to us on the radio. We work very closely with them. Um, there was shots fired into a residence in Connecticut Sunday evening at 6 p.m. The car was tracked and last pinged on 91 northbound in Deerfield at 7:10 p.m. They then turned around upon engaging in a pursuit in Berniston southbound through Deerfield and crashed in Hoyoke, at which point the subject was apprehended. And that was a shooting into a residence in Connecticut. I'm not even sure that made the news. 
So state police always relies on us. We rely on them. If there's a violent domestic in, in Conway or something, they may ask us to slide up because they have a desk officer. There's a 91 cruiser and there's an area cruiser that covers all of Franklin County. Their minimum, minimum manning is a desk and two. So it's not abnormal that we help them. They help us. The biggest assistance that I would say that we provide to Greenfield and state police on an on sometimes daily basis, weekly basis at minimum, is a female officer for a search. Because we have two amazing female police officers, and they all know it. Yep, Jen and Marissa are phenomenal. Greenfield or state, whether it's Northampton Barracks or Shelburne Barracks, calls for them, I would say, at minimum two to four times a week. And they shoot up, they'll search somebody, and they're back. Yep. So we have a, a great rapport and relationship. Yeah. So do we want to jump into payroll or we got any more questions? Yeah, let's actually review some budgets. I, I, have, I actually have a question, oh, wait. if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how much of your time did you say you were going to allocate to patrol? Uh, right now, I think next month, I told Adam to put me on 10 out of 20 shifts. So 50%, probably in March, maybe he's got me on 12 or 14. Could be upwards of 75%. Yeah, I thought you said a three-quarter number. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I told him he could go up to three-quarters. Are, are there plans to get you back down uh, in 2024 Probably later not. on or 2025? No, I mean, the challenge for me is, and Carolyn knows this better than anybody, I'm on like 18 committees statewide and input and leadership, and it's just going to be a challenge for me. So what I did is I gave Adam my five busiest days a month with meetings and said, no matter what, backfill these, everything else I can cover as a patrol if you need me to. Try and keep me between 10 to 15 shifts and, you know, try and give me these five off. And that's our deal for March and probably right through June. So are you, are you doing this to try and mitigate an increase in the budget? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yep. Julie, you want to start into payroll? Yes, please. Great. All right, so top right, police payroll should be uh, 210, 5110. And so you have my salary, you have the sergeant's salaries, you have the patrolman salaries. As we go down, the administrative assistant training, I increased. Thank God I got my glasses on. Jeez. <laughs> um, training under the post commission standards has dramatically increased. We know police officers uh, by state law have to have 40 hours of in service. They also have to have three firearms qualifications a year. Under the new taser requirements, they have to have four hours of taser requirements a year. CPR first aid is on top of the 40 hours, and then anything specialized thereafter that they'd like to attend for training. So I think police officers on annual recertification are probably the highest of any profession I've ever seen. And on one hand, that's a very good thing. So you see uh, training for full-time and then part-time. I kind of increased both of those numbers up uh, 6,000 for full-time and then 4,000 for part-time. Uh, shift coverage for part-time folks stayed the same. I left extra hours at the same. Extra hours is always spare hours to cover those side tourism events that we don't back charge people for. Um, could be a road race for Veterans Day and it's a startup organization. There's no way for me to bill them for two detail cops. I just can't. And it's such an amazing event. And that's the whole basis of our community. It's the core of our community, those events. So we've had that money in the budget for probably the last 20 years. And honestly, the last 20 years, I think it's been $10,500. <laughs> we've ever increased it, even during Chief Waz or myself. Uh, let's see. Quindle. John always. Uh, I just want to put say that John always um, allows an officer to, to be there for our clinics. Um, obviously, we ran a lot of clinics during COVID, um, so that was extra hours, and he was able to make make it happen in that budget amount. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, educational incentives. So police officers have a base salary rate, and then the Quinn bill. That was established back in 1974, provided for 10% for an associate's, 20% for a bachelor's, and 25% for a master's degree. This encompasses all the full-time police officers there. Uh, Nate Walker did not have an associate's or a bachelor's degree. 
And two of the officers that were looking to replace Nate with one has a bachelor's and one has an associates. I had to increase that up a little bit between payroll, new contracts, and the hiring replacement of Nate Walker that didn't have a degree going to state police and the two folks that are internally part-time that have a bachelor's and an associates. I had to jump that up a little bit. And then you go down to uh, the school resource officer stipend. That $5,200 is just 100 hours a week. That's um, that's a little tickle for Brian for staying when he's there until four o'clock every day, not putting in for overtime, answering his cell phone on the weekends, answering his cell phone at night, dealing with DCF and dealing with families and the internet complaints and the social media bullying and people inappropriately taking pictures of their private parts and sending it to each other and should not be. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> it with 24 to 2,600 students in town, it never ends. Brian does an amazing job mitigating those without getting any criminal court involved. Overtime pay, you can see, went from the 27,950 that Dave and I talked about up to 40,000. And I just took a stab at that, that it is going to go up over the years. If I can turn some in for free cash, great. Uh, vacation pay, I pretty much kept it the same as a top level part-time police officer replacing all the vacation time. Holiday pay is a general stab. Holidays, if a police officer works, they either can take time and a half and they can take an additional day off later on down the road, or they can take double time and a half. So this is always kind of a variable, how much I can turn in. And after that, holiday pay, we have personal pay, just personal days off. That's, again, backfilled at the part-time rate at the maximum $25 an hour. And then the crossing guard in the center of town. The crossing guard at the elementary school is through DES's budget. We pay for the one for the center of town. And then longevity pay down bottom for Mark and Adam. Um, the unfortunate part is, in total, it came up 96,903, which is 9.75%. And I'm wide open to any thoughts or suggestions. I can tell you last year, I probably turned back 50,000. I don't remember. You got it right there. Well, I'd, I'd have to add it up, but. Um, this year I am flirting much, much closer. Normally at oh, this. Yeah. At least 50. Right. I thought it was closer to 65, but I was trying to yeah. behave myself. Yeah, it, so, it is closer to that. Um, it, it varies so much year to year in a public safety budget that you can't cut it down to the penny. Listen, if I, if I was the select board of the assessors and to give you a payroll budget is as simplistic as it comes. Like 40 hours a week is 40 hours a week is 40 hours a week. But when you run a true 24-hour public safety agency, it gets extremely complicated thereafter. This year, I'm flirting much closer. I'm hovering in the positive in my budget right now. Last time I looked, I think about seven or eight thousand dollars. I'm normally at about thirty right now, thirty-five. Well, you also just have a lot of staff. <laughs> Question for the overtime departments. You've got a lot of people. Yeah. 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 Question on the overtime. Sure. The, uh, you, I think you probably just explained it, but you, you uh, we're at forty thousand versus twenty seven nine fifty, and that was to the increase there was to cover. I think unfortunately, there's going to be a point in time after July first that right. we cannot staff yep. midnight shifts with a part time police officer. Right, That's and I see that coming down the road. I see it literally in the fall. Yeah, I literally have two younger folks left that will work midnights and yeah. I see them departing in the near future. And it's, it's just not going to be good. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. John. Um, Ravish. Yep. School He's, resource officer. Um, he kind of had a dip in 2023, just less hours. No, the town finance director can be extremely frugal. And because I turned back a lot of money the previous year, she sweet talked me into taking fifteen thousand out of that line item to try and help the budget last year. Okay, because <laughs> all right, because <laughs> that explains you, you and I have a great relationship. <laughs> <laughs> That's because there is some SRO money that often comes from the schools, and so so his pay can be 
allocated to that fund rather than put in the general fund. So you got a little wiggle room yeah. there. Yeah. I didn't ask you for it this year because I know how tight you're going to be and how difficult things are. So yeah. So one of the side conversations that Brenda and I had, just so everything's out there, is we never put money aside to put somebody through the full-time police academy. So my wiggle room in the budget behind the scenes is the school resource officer line because I get 30000 from Deerfield Academy and I get seventeen from Frontier. That 47000 helps on the backside. If I have to put a full-time cop through the police academy, I then don't have to come back to the finance committee and ask for a forty dollars or $50,000 reserve fund transfer. Some years it works out well where I give back $65,000 last year. In some years, I give back 10, 20, or 30. It's kind of the wiggle room in the budget. We fully fund the school resource officer, and then we get that side money. September 1st, we start taking that salary out of that school resource officer account, and then we generally stop in about mid-June. Yep. This, and Brenda and I discussed- Actually in mid-April. Yeah. yeah. Put it back into your budget. A lot of this is out of everybody's control. Yeah. Like yeah. the Quinn bill. Yes. You know, in fairness, accuracy, you know, maybe in the future, we look at adding a line for the academy and we reduce the school resource officer. I don't know. Or we just continue to do that. It's it's half Six, done. Six one and a half dozen of the other. No money. So much. even if there's a line item, we approve the total amount and you have full discretion to Yes. Like wash the funds back and forth as yes. long as it's within this line. Yes. Within this yeah, it's a single line item. Payroll line item. So even if we did what you just said, it wouldn't affect it. Right. Yep. I right. got you. But hold on. But the forty-seven thousand isn't in this budget. No. It's not in the budget. So you're saying when you when you're saying it's no. If he were to change, like if we change um, the SRO officers' pay from seventy-two five to. 25 know, or whatever. Sure. off of that. Is. Yeah. Um, you'd think I'd be able to do math. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but then put in another line item that said police academy and put 47,000 on it. The bottom line would be the same. And he has full discretion to swap right. it back and forth anyway. Yeah. And I think that was Brenda's reasoning at the time as well. Right. Yeah. I just, I like you guys to have all the data so you can make an educated <laughs> decision. And if it's overwhelming, I apologize. I need a motion. I make a motion to approve police payroll uh, 210-5110 for um, 1,099,17. Second. Any other discussion or questions? This is a little matter much, but you said that you pay for the crossing guard in town. Yes. But there's really three crossing guards. The yeah, the two. school pays for two. They pay for Pleasant Street. Yeah, and the one right in front of the elementary school. Yep. Just, I think it's worth a comment. A lot of this is out of the town's control, like the Quinn bill. Right, that's nothing we can do about it. And the overtime, because you can't have part-time police anymore. Mm -hmm. We could try. So it's oh, we're gonna try. We're yeah. stuck. Anyway, that's just my thoughts. I mean, it's payroll, so it's all. Pretty it's much payroll, separate, yeah. Except for the Quinn bill. So you can't over. take it and spend it on right a new Expenses. copier with nope. copier dollars. Nope. <laughs> nope. So copier's still working. <laughs> I gave that ten grand back. I remember. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. I'll burn that thing till the end of time. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Right. My Rose Risa cruiser that we sidelined is 179,910, $179,910 miles. <laughs> and we just transferred it as the detail car. So it's still going to be running. Plus, who knows how many hours just died. Huh? Sure. All right. Um, any, any further discussion or questions? No, it's been moved and seconded for police payroll at 1,090,917. Uh, all those in favor? That's unanimous 600. Uh, did we as a select board vote it? I don't think we did. We haven't yet. Okay. I would make a motion to support the budget at $1,090,917. 
I'll second it. Thank you, Tim. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. All right, the next budget is the Police Department Expense 210-5400 for 118,100. Somebody had a question? Um, no, no. No. I thought I heard somebody. Yeah, no, I have a general question for Brenda at the end of this, but I'll hopefully okay. I'll remind oh, myself that. Okay. <laughs> hopefully I can answer it. Uh, police department expenses, 210 Uh Clothing regular, I realize we're missing one of the full-time police officers in there. Um, all of them get $800 a year. There's 10 full-time cops. It's 8000 I just jumped that up, $800. Uh, 4800 for part-time people. And gasoline, I left at 32000 and that seems like it's holding pretty well. The new hybrid cruisers are uh, are amazing on gas. We went from averaging about 11 miles per gallon on the all gas vehicles to about 22 to 24 miles per gallon on the hybrid cars. Right. We have one cruiser left on patrol, not the detail car, but out of five patrol cars, one's left that's gas only. We have now four hybrid cars. And yeah, I mean, it's they work out very well, very well. At accident scenes or, or anything else, they're shutting off. And then 10, 20 minutes later, when the lights or radios are drawing them down, they fire up for five or eight minutes, they charge up the batteries and they shut right back off again. So they're functioning very well so far. So that was a good uh, good move. Yep, I know Kip and I were years ago were fighting. He wanted me to get a Toyota Prius and I told him it would not happen. <laughs> yes, yep. He said, it, I said, you have my promise. As soon as they come out with a, a pursuit rated cruiser, that's a hybrid, Kip, I will absolutely do it. And the number one first order in the state was Deerfield, Massachusetts. Yep. Yep. Uh, so 32,000 for gas. Tires, uh, 4,000 is generally decent. Cruiser repair, 9,000 is decent overall. Um, is that done in the, um, like, does our town mechanic do that? Or do you go somewhere for that? Uh, sometimes it's the town mechanic. Often it's Marcotte Ford. It's a major repair. So if it's an oil change or brakes, Chuck will do it at highway. But if it's a more major repair, it goes to Marcotte Ford down in Hoyoke, uh, they have the most uh, amazing mechanics. You'll see cruisers there from the Berkshires and town highway trucks because they pay their mechanics extremely well and they hold on to them for 20 to 30 years. You bring your car once, it's fixed, it's fixed right. Other spots, we've taken them to other Ford dealerships and not nearly the same service level. Yep. Thanks. Sure. John, the only question I had on tires, I mean, given supply chain, increases and stuff like that you really think four thousand is enough uh i just i tried to keep the budget as low as possible this year you know i'll uh no matter what i'll make it work and then we'll take a peek at it next year and see if we we need to gently increase that so okay yeah yeah we'll make it work carolyn and in but we will need to take a peek at that yeah i mean everything is just astronomical now i was gonna ask the same thing tires have gone up like crazy yeah. Uh, so the good part is, is we're on state bid and that mm -hmm. bid is good for a year. Oh, okay. Yep. So in that bid expires uh, June 30th. And what happens is if I get a little wiggle room in the budget, if I have two, three, four grand left in expenses, I call up Northampton tire and I order winter or summer tires. And I put them out back in the metal building that we call the Butler building and I stockpile them. So that way we know we have them at that old price. price. Yeah. Yep. Uh, good. I mean, most of the stuff is the same going down, going down, going down. What else? Uh, full-time police academy. I did add in a line to train one person a year for $3,000. If you'd like, I could try and encompass that somewhere else within the expenses because it is, again, like Julie's noted at the end, it's one line item. I've eaten that in the past. I certainly can try again in the future, but I did want to note it in there and at least put it in front of the finance committee to see if you'd like to keep me trying to eat it out of the budget or if we actually want to put a line item in there for the full-time academy. That's not for the uniforms. That's not for the ammunition. That's not for anything. That's just the fee that goes straight to the state. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. If I covered everything, that would be closer to five to $6,000 in expenses. That's anticipating losing one cop a year. So you you're basically expecting to just fund one academy per year in the, from now going forward yes if not okay. two yeah yeah john what's an equipment eighty four hundred dollars 
Uh, that's generally new equipment that we purchase and just cycle throughout the year. It could be portable uh, breathalyzers. It can be tasers. It can be all kinds of stuff for the police department. It's just that general stuff that really isn't amount to anything to go in front of capital. Right. Yeah. No, I just wondered yeah. what they were. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Basically a level budget, except for the police academy. Mm -hmm. 3,000. Yep. <laughs> additional clothing. Yeah, so let's, let's move on. We have a motion. Um, I move that we recommend the sum of 118100 for police department expenses, account number 210 5400. Second that. Any discussion? Questions? Nope. All the, have you guys voted it yet? Nope. I'll wait till after you. I'll just do these right after you. Okay. We generally do it the other way around, but whatever. Oh. All those in favor? <laughs> That's unanimous. I make a motion to approve 118100 uh, as the expense for the police department. I'll second it. Thank you, Tim. Uh, all those in favor? Tim Elche, aye. Kevin McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Both. It Good. doesn't. It makes sense for us to do it after the select board because select board is supposed to come up to the budget, and we're the ones who present it to the town. Right. So we're supposed to approve like yeah. the whole thing, recommend the whole thing to the town. So we don't want to recommend it if they don't recommend it. You want, you want me to go first then? Yeah, I would just yeah, figure you guys were having more of the discussion, nope. and then when you're ready to signal, and we'll vote. All right. So before we talk or anybody takes a motion on the police cruiser, 210, 5,800, I want to reduce that back down to 55,000. Hmm. You get a deal? And uh, nobody's making a motion yet. Perfect. Good. Okay. So last year we anticipated a massive increase in the budget. We submitted a request to order cruiser from last year's annual town meeting, six months before town meeting. That car arrived last week. Yeah. Mm. We so then got word that cruisers, those hybrid cruisers were going up between ten to fourteen thousand dollar base price. And the end bid number was eighty eight hundred dollar increase. However, Sergeant Ravish had already written a letter to MHQ and reserved a 2022 model oh. that arrived a few weeks ago. So we are locked in at the 2022 model price, $8,800 less than a 2023 model. They are waiting for town meeting before they start to build that car, which will replace our last gas fully car as patrol. You will then have five hybrids on the road. So other departments across the area had, there was 1,500 Ford vehicles canceled in Massachusetts, and we got our second order. So, so 55,000, not 55, 65, no. please. I'll entertain a motion to approve the police cruiser for 55,000. I'll second that, Carolyn. Okay, yeah, then I'll make that motion. We got a second. Any, any further? No. Discussion? Thank you. Way. Just want to say thank you because, I mean, that's why we, supported the freight liner earlier um it's you know these price increases are crazy so just to clarify that means we have a zero percent increase zero percent right okay all those in favor tim hilchey aye Trevor mcdaniel aye carolyn ness aye thank you thank you to brian ravish yes yeah. all right do we have a motion I'll make a motion to approve police department cruiser account two ten fifty eight hundred dollars. Two ten fifty eight hundred is the account number for fifty five thousand dollars. We have a second. I'll second that. The sheet needs to, for the record, the sheet needs to be changed. Right. I crossed mine out. <laughs> yeah. Wrote in the new. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just save toner and ink by just crossing it out. Write it in. Write the new number in, and 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 you can so we have it with the next detail summary report. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So we have two cruisers. We have two police officers going all the time. Yes. Yeah. And then we have details and yep. stuff. So where are the where are the other 
two or three cruisers. In the garage bay or there's some outside. So if they're using the two brand new cars that are in the bay, you'll generally see like three or four cars in the lot. Uh -huh. If there's only like one or two cars in the lot, then they're, they may be using the cars from the bay. It's senior people. So what happens when we get brand new cruisers is I cycle them between the full-time cops and two people are assigned to those brand new cruisers. As they cycle down to year four and five, then I start to allow the part-time folks to drive them because traditionally our part-time folks were 20 to 30 year olds, new, eager, very energetic and very hard on throttles at which point the chief would see them off duty doing things that they were not supposed to be. So we would not let them touch a brand new car. So the brand new cars cycle between the full-time people. And that way, every few years, if you're a full-time police officer for me, you're getting a brand new car and it gives them buy. -in. So the same person generally drives yep. the same car. Yeah. They're then, assigned okay. to them for all four years. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. What happened to the motorcycle? It's still in there, despite my disagreement. <laughs> I'm waiting for one or two to retire, and that will uh, be auctioned. Yeah. So the the, the numbers. Townspeople are love it. Couple, two, three of my certified cops love it. Yeah, you can see I'm very optimistic. But the cost, whatever, <laughs> as minimal as it may be, we're in here, right? It's four hundred and seventeen dollars to insure it. It's in the town's general insurance budget. It's all included in here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Any other discussion? <clears throat> no, it's been moved and seconded for the police department cruiser at fifty-five thousand dollars in favor. That's unanimous six zero zero. Good. And I think the last is the regional animal control officer, which is shared between the city of Greenfield, Montague, and Deerfield. Do you have a number for that? That's two ninety-two dash fifty four hundred. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. They didn't fix it, did they? <laughs> uh, so you can see the salary line, the benefits, the life insurance, the operating, and the totals in Greenfield, Montague, and Deerfield. Uh, Deerfield, by our current agreement, pays the 25%, which comes out to be 20527 And on top of that, we pay into the Sheriff's Department Regional Animal Kennel up in Montague $1,000 a year which brings the total animal control officer budget to 21,527. Uh, I know we collect in dog license fees anywhere from 15 to $20,000 a year to offset this. The select board increased that years ago. So we do have some revenue that offsets this line that's there. That's your dog fees and animal fees. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of this. I'm just curious. So who, who is this? Is this a Greenfield or a Montague person? So the person's full-time Greenfield employee out of the police department, but they're a regional animal control officer. So they changed the law in, uh, in 2014 or 15, where towns actually have to have a certified animal control officer that's registered through the state. And we went, oh God, who can we find that small for Deerfield to work five or 10 hours a week maybe 15 that's available for calls that's actually going to be certified. And Greenfield said, well, we have a person. Why don't we just, he's already certified. He can come to Deerfield. He can come to Montague. We'll just share the salary. You don't have that many calls. And the select boards all sat down and the, and, uh, the mayor, and they negotiated this out. And this was the, uh, the end agreement to that. Maybe we need our canine control fees because we only took in four thousand two hundred and sixty five dollars last it? year really and that's about what i think it usually is oh yeah yep select board we may have to look at dog license fees mm -hmm. okay yep i i thought it was much higher my bad yeah didn't we all get more dogs in the pandemic <laughs> <laughs> five oh we only charge five dollars for a a neutered dog in ten dollars for non. So right, it's it's so, low. Yeah, yeah, it is low. I'll entertain a, a motion from select board. I will make that motion, Carolyn. Yes, second. We'll second it. All right. Any further for select board? I I just want to say um, the animal control officer um, handles skunks and bats and all kinds of stuff, and. Dick Kalashevsky and myself used to respond to that. So I have to say it's been a relief to have this. I was one of the negotiators on this because after a few skunk calls, you don't really want to keep going out. So. <laughs> and, uh, all those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. 
Trevor McDaniel I. Carolyn S. I. There's a long story behind this, but basically we're going to vote for this. <laughs> All right. Do we have a motion? I move that the finance committee recommend the sum of 21527 for account number 292-5400 for canine control. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Six. All right. That's unanimous. Is that it? I think so. All right. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, if you ever have a question, reach out to me anytime. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. You. Okay. Let's do projected revenues. I'll send you the audit too. I'll put both of that. Yeah, Rebbe, sure. no, read through them. Oh, okay. Or skim them quick and yeah, make sure you're comfortable. Just dated. Right. Boilerplate. Those are Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You wanna you wanna go through the revenue detail? I think so. Yep. Okay. I handed that out to everybody tonight. Um, the tax levy number probably changed a little bit from the tax levy sheet that I handed out to you before because of what I did to kind of figure out what we would do for debt. And I didn't think it was worth handing out a new tax levy sheet there'll be lots more changes before we're done. So, so that number might change a little bit based on our, our excluded debt uh, payments. We did get cherry sheet, uh, the governor's version of the cherry sheet revenues and expenditures. And I did plug those into this. Um, pretty typical, not much change. Uh, there have been some years that we've had less of an increase and some years that we might have had barely a little bit more, but the net result is $40,000 more to the town of Deerfield uh, for our general fund budget. This is usually um, just for you new people. Um, it's, we go with what the governor issues as their budget until we're down to the tax recap and then we're forced into the final. But we've always, the town of Deerfield has always just gone with the governor's numbers to prepare our budget for the spring and have it voted at town meeting. House House two is usually more generous and it, it's, it, but we never know what it is until the end. So that's why we go with the governor's house. Yeah. Yes, it's usually more conservative. Correct. Yeah, Thanks, Carolyn. More conservative. Yeah. Um, um, I, Brenda, Brenda oh. quick question. Um, the revenues that are projected at 55,853, and then the, the net, what accounts? I mean, why do you report a lower number? Is there certain things that you can't pay for from a cherry sheet receipt or? So there are two items on the cherry sheet that don't go into our general fund budget. One is the school choice number, which goes into the school's uh, school choice fund. And the other one is the uh, library state aid to the library. And that goes into a special fund for the library to use. Okay. If that's what you're looking at. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. And then we talked about overlay tonight. I still have that at 65,000 until they tell me it should be something different. But you'll see from past years in fiscal 20 and 21, we were at 50,000. Then in 22, which was a research year, it was high. And then in fiscal 23, I think what Skip was saying tonight, the reason it was so high for fiscal 23 was because they were expecting um, maybe to be forced into some abatements for the utilities. So I, I have no idea what we're going to do for fiscal 24, but 65,000 seemed like a reasonable number to use um, for the time being. 
Um, since I gave you the last revenue detail report, I think I went back and I looked at meals and rooms tax that we've collected so far this year. So we've had a half a year's worth of of taxes and the numbers are looking really good. Um, so I felt that we could go up on our estimate for that. I'm, it's being kind of aggressive, but it's still conservative. I'm Looking at the numbers for the year, we could be at 440,000, 450,000 for revenues. Um, I'd like to attribute that to Treehouse. I don't know, but that's my thought. There's always somebody there every night when I drive busy. By. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Or when I stop in, it's usually pretty crowded. So um, the other number I changed was the miscellaneous non recurring number. Uh, at the bottom to reflect the $7,500 or so that we'll be getting from the districts to help pay for the stipends that are in the treasurer collector's uh, salary line item and in the uh, assessor's clerk salary line item. And um, I'm sorry, taking questions, they don't want to get through the whole thing. It, you can, it, whatever you want. Do you want to? I was a little, a little concerned when. Uh, Kevin Scarborough mentioned the chapter 90 money is down um, quite a bit. I personally, I know it means work for you, but I think we should reflect it on here so we can see it. But this if, is this is for our general fund budget, so so we don't reflect it here. The chapter 90 money goes through a special revenue fund, just like okay. right. your details go through a special revenue fund right. or planning board fees, you know, things like that. So okay. this yep. is strictly, right. you're right. Yeah. Yep, our omnibus Got budget. It. And and John, we've been advised that probably there will be a cre increase in chapter 90. Not sure yet, obviously, but um, there is indication that there will may be an increase. Uh, fingers crossed. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much, but. I, I also have a question. Um, you just mentioned that the the miscellaneous non recurring revenue includes the some of the stipends. Why is that non recurring? Isn't that going to be recurring? It might be. I just did not want to add that line item at the moment. Okay. I need to look at the the rules and what I think uh, belongs in which category. Um, if you go to the second page, uh, the administrative costs that we charge to the EMS, to wastewater treatment, and to the senior center are all in there, the current numbers that are in their budgets. So that was the change from the last time that um, I handed out, handed out the um, revenue detail. So it brings us to a total total revenue estimated revenue at eighteen million one twenty three seven sixty three. Um, we have uh, what I handed out tonight was uh, Franklin Tech. We have the assessment from Franklin Tech. Um, we have the capital assessment for Frontier and for Franklin Tech. So the only school numbers that we don't have in the budget right now are, of course, Frontier's assessment and their transportation costs, as well as DES. Um, I just did a, a quick and dirty today. Um, I understand that Frontier is looking to go up less than 3%, but Deerfield's portion of that might be much higher because we have more students at Frontier we had a, a reduction of students at Franklin Tech, which is why our Franklin Tech number went down. So I just did a quick and dirty and said, okay, if we if if the budgets we don't have all went up an average of 3.25% or 3.5%, what would that look like? Um, we're still short of our revenue or we're over the revenue number based on the few things that need to be plugged in like the schools, those schools, as well as uh, Smith Volk number, as well as the snow and ice number. Um, and that's ignoring capital. So 
just just putting that out there. Um, Brenda, you um, in this in the various administrative costs, every line item except skims shows a positive delta. Can you explain why this one went down? Or is um, the senior center budget has gone up quite a bit. And so has the wastewater treatment plant budget, but SCIMS has remained pretty, pretty flat for the most part. Um, without looking at the specific details of those calculations, I, I don't know why SCIMS would have gone down otherwise, but um, uh, I, I, I couldn't tell you right offhand. And if you want, I could look that up, and I could I could get back to you. Yeah, if you if you have time in your day, <laughs> I'm just curious because obviously you know all of the costs of the staff that are represented have gone up, and so it's a mere curiosity. Right. Um, there is one line item in that calculation, which is health insurance for the employees that are in this building that are part of that whole thing. And it could be that the, that the health insurance has gone down. Um, uh, okay. Just not thinking of it, thinking of, of what else would have, would have made that change other, other than really because wastewater treatment plant is going up and there are other budgets that have gone up the EMS portion of our total $22 million that we budget in this year is not as high as it was because those calculations are based on the percentage of their budget as compared to the entire budget for the entire town. So that's, that's um, in my mind, that's what I'm thinking it is, but. Okay, thank you. Be, uh, I'll let you know. Anybody have any questions on that revenue detail? Well, now I do. So <laughs> you were just explaining Dang. that the, <laughs> the administrative expense is calculated basically as a ratio uh, on the basis of a ratio between the the outside department, we will call it, and the town uh, budgets. Correct. Right. Okay. That seems very odd. I mean, it, it, the work doesn't change whether the town is spending more money or not. No, but um, the calculation of, of what we can charge them, I would hope that the workload, and it, and it isn't always, I mean, this isn't a, this isn't a perfect um, scenario where we get the exact calculation, but you would hope that that their relation, their costs in relation to the entire budget are probably reflective of the proportion of, I don't know, help me out, Julie, the proportion of costs associated with that, with that operation. When we, when we tried to work on the formula, I understand. it was the budget and, and a set, say like the SCEMS budget is fairly flat whereas the town is increasing its budget. Um, so as a, you know, as a cost, it's less. Right. Um, or but, it's down or it's right, stable. Right. Dollar value, the amount of work they're doing isn't going down. <laughs> right. right. So is this like a state, is this a uh, an equation that's given to us no. by somebody or this oh, is something we decided? Heck no, there's a million ways you can cut this up. And it used to be at one point in time, we were charging scams. 10%. Oh, but budget or a... it 10% of the of the line items that we include in this calculation which you know is general insurance it's my department it's the treasurer collector's department it's the select board office including the select board salaries it's um uh, a portion of contracted services like legal fees 
uh, legal fees, correct. So um, those are all costs that are allocated, um, but the 10% seemed high. I don't spend 10% of my time on, on, on EMS uh, on an average basis. So okay. it made more sense to use the budget, uh, their budget in comparison to the entire budget for the town is, as, a, as a better way to allocate those expenditures. I mean, it just seems weird because like if the town is borrowing a lot of money, for example, and that's where we're going to have to do more debt service, that doesn't reduce the amount of work that you do for scams or wastewater treatment plant. You can see what I mean. Um, hmm, I see what you're getting at. Yeah, I know. I would sort of, sort of piling on to Jim's comment, it sounds more like what what is the administrative costs and what are the departments? And that's a more accurate reflection of when you divide it up um, as opposed to revenue and, or, you know, the total budget expenditure. Um, but as you say, you can make this many, many different ways. So I was just curious. Yeah. It, um... We fussed about this for months, right, Brenda? We did, and Casey and I've been through it a million times, and we went through it again this this spring to just say, you know, do these things make sense? Does does this calculation seem reasonable? Uh, you know, you could come up with a million different numbers, but you got to start with something, and and we wanted to be consistent from year to year with what we were doing. When we when we first started doing this, the very first um, operation that was that this was applicable to was skims, and that was at the ten percent. But then when we added the wastewater treatment plant, somebody made the decision to do it the way we're doing it now, and so then we switched all of them to that same calculation. Okay. It's not to say that we shouldn't review it, and but I think um, Brenda handles the budget on a regular basis. So if she feels like it's starting to be not enough of, as a percentage of her time, then I, you know, I feel like we should review it again. But we did put a lot of thought into this and a lot of calculation. Yep. Time was spent, staff time reviewing this. Mm -hmm. Well, I just. Uh... The reason why it was interesting to me is because, um, you know, skims full t FTEs went up to um, their overtime budget is 121,000. Um, you know, if if we're saying that uh, the reason that uh, the wastewater treatment plant um, jumped 8,600 was because they have more staff, um, that's the same situation as at skims. But Anyway, um, obviously a lot of thought went into this and- Well, the wastewater treatment plant how now has debt. Yep. So there- that's, that's a big expense, yeah, of your time. And that's also, yeah, time yeah. spent by you, so. Right. Doesn't add any more time to your job. <laughs> yeah. I sit here often and don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Anything else in relation to the detail revenue revenue detail? Okay. No. Um, do you want to look at the history, or do you want to yeah. everybody oh, just yeah, to yeah. look at that separately? I just sure. I you know I keep keep this report. Uh, this is actually one of the reports that I'm now using to um, fill in details for the um, financial, financial indicators. indicators. Okay. And so I updated it and I thought, well, why not just print it out for everybody to look at so you can see what, you know, what the 10 year history looks like. Sorry, Carolyn, yours is in your box. <laughs> oh no, that's fine. It's my fault. I think that the thing that's um, most interesting to me is the local receipts because that's where you want to budget conservatively, but there could be some fluctuations. Yeah, that's all over the map. 
It is, yes. And, even the specific. And, and yet that has to absorb any taxes that you don't collect because you're never going to collect 100% of your taxes in a year. So you have to have a little bit of wiggle room in your local receipts to cover that shortfall. Well, it's particularly interesting that things like the trash fees seem to go up and down on a considerable range. Um, well, they, they were way down in 2020 because in 2020 we had COVID and we were not pre-selling any um, stickers. Usually Everything was locked down. So we, we, um, we, we had let people run on the old stickers for what, three months was it, Brenda? I, I don't remember. I thought it was in August, late August that you started uh, yeah. at the transfer station. Yeah. So that's why 2020 is way low and 2021 is way high. But otherwise, you're looking at about 180000 on an average, um, ignoring 2013 and 14, because I think we raised the price of the bags somewhere in there. I can't remember which year it was. But then you also get this dip in 2016. Oh, yeah, you do. Yeah, I see that in 2016. I don't know what that was. <laughs> That's what I mean. It's, I can't remember that far back. <laughs> it's a noisy graph. <laughs> Motor vehicle excise also had a huge variation. Also, COVID. Going from 790 down to 682 and then back to 760. It's a bit odd. Mm -hmm. they're, they're going to China. Couldn't get a car last year. Couldn't get a car. Yeah. That's cars. right. Yeah. Yeah. 2021. Is that chip shortage or? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, there were a lot less. Could it be something like maybe the bills got sent out? Wait. Right? Could be something like um, could be. They come from the um the, Our, the registry, so they're not usually sent uh, out late. No. Uh -uh. Um, but the main one, you know, comes out like in January or February, so uh, that usually doesn't vary. Okay, so why did rental income go up during 1920? Because uh, the EMS building was built, and yeah. now the EMS is paying us some rent. But it dropped back down. <laughs> right. So we so it was years. we're just testing. We held, we held a couple well, years. For a very short period of time, we put a hundred percent into the budget until we could get uh, no, a no, stabilization fund yeah. created. And then we moved that money. And now there's 75% of the revenues that go directly into the stabilization fund and only 25% into the into the town's coffers. Yeah. Amazing how much you remember. It is. <laughs> it hasn't completely all leaked out. <laughs> yes. The problem is the longer you hang around, the years get mixed up. No. <laughs> Not that you forget. It's just like, oh my God, that was like 20 years ago, 15 years right. ago. Any other okay. questions on revenues or? Um, yeah, Brenda, can you talk a little bit about um, the fluctuation in pilot payments? Um, I, you know what? Um, payments in lieu. Is that in here? Well, I don't know that it's fluctuated a lot. However, there are some years that, let's say, Eagle Brook, um, for many years, notoriously wrote their check on June 30th and sometimes didn't get it to us till the end of July. So it ended up in the other fiscal year. Yeah. Um, or uh, Bement. The bent didn't pay us for a couple of years. Giving us occasionally, but they weren't really giving us much, you know, or Woolman Hill gives us some one yeah. year and then they don't for the next five years That's or correct. something like that. So um, that would be what, what, what causes that fluctuation. Uh, Deerfield Academy has been pretty consistent. Yeah. They give us two check checks a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, basically and though, they don't, in, they don't build into COLA then. They just say the dollars we paid in 2013, which are worth much less or much more than the dollars that are worth now, they don't they don't adjust it any. They that do. would be true of Eagle Brook, but the others the A, tend yeah. to give more. They do. Yeah, and Eagle Brook has not changed their donation to us in the nine years that I've been here. Yeah. Hmm. Twenty six thousand dollars. Another reason to have the assessors look at that property. <laughs> yeah, I'm really hoping that that does happen. 
Any other revenue history questions? No, okay. We are not gonna do miscellaneous budgets tonight. Um, we're gonna try and wrap up the financial indicators, the annual report input, and then plan for upcoming meetings. Um, I just wanted to share one thing. Um, we talked about, I think it was two weeks ago, um, that we talked about our comparison with other towns in the state. And one thing we were looking at was tax bill over income. And we were talking about the income per capita. Um, and I said something that was completely incorrect. So um, Carolyn does go back and talk to the state about our, our income per capita dollar value but that specifically it's part of the calculation of how much money we get for state, for schools. Um, and so for only for that school calculation, they go through and take out the Waitley houses that are um, in the Deerfield zip code. And they look at the um, incomes that are associated with um, nonprofit addresses um, since they don't pay any taxes to the town, so they take those out. So that number goes down. That calculation is not reflected in this dollar value. So our income in the DOR or in the in the DLS website stuff includes part of Waitley and includes all those nonprofit um, income. So our income is higher than it should be, and I have no clue how to guess what that number really should be. So when we looked at, we were talking about our tax bill as a percent of income and how we compare to other towns in the state. Um, and I, I, I don't feel like it's all that accurate, um, but I don't have any suggestion for what to do about that. Um, as long as worth. we're comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges, I don't think it matters, you know, as a, well, I, as a year by year indicator, as long as it's consistent. You know, as, if we compare internally year to year, but if we compare ourselves to other towns, then I think our income is artificially high in these numbers compared to other towns. I but mean, then, I'm sure there's other towns. I saw a bunch of stuff in the paper a few years ago about like Shelburne. Yeah, I was going to say that they happens to all the other towns. They too. have they have the same difficulty. Mm -hmm. I think in Eastern Mass is probably better because the zip codes probably correlate with the towns. The, the problem is we could we could try to get waiver or you know try to get some of this stuff addressed. But the the thing is that the reason why I don't feel like we have a good chance is because there are a lot of communities across the the state or the Commonwealth that do have, you know, high percentages of nonprofits. That's, yeah. You know, yeah. And the zip code and the zip code mess up is, is really a Western mass issue. But on the other hand, it, it does cover like 60 something communities. So the state doesn't want to take it on truthfully. Yeah. So when we were talking about this, and if you look at these number here, so for the entire state, um, we were saying that our tax bill divided by our, our average single family tax bill divided by our income per capita, we're at 11%. And if you compare that to the whole state, we're 303rd. So there's 302 towns who have a greater percentage of their income is the, the, the average single family house. Out of 351. So we're right out of but, 351. But so you think that actually you should be higher on that list. Somewhat, but I mean, we're not going to get up to the top of it. But, no. So, so, anyways, um, I just wanted to, since we had talked about that last time, um, throw that up there. Those numbers. I think, did I send these spreadsheets out to everybody? I'll send them out again, just so you can have them if you care. Um, Are you planning to change that indicator in the packet that we hand out? So 
So that's not in the packet that we hand out. Oh, okay. We could add something to that, but um, so we have the executive summary. So I, I handed out a little packet on the back of the agenda that I scribbled on. There's a Deerfield Financial Indicators Executive Summary. Um, I highlighted one thing um, Don commented to me, which is a good comment that, I mean, the, the way our budget is looking right now, and we're sort of <laughs> feels like we're headed towards a prop two and a half override question discussion. Um, when you look at, we, as we said on the whole, the financial position of the town of Deerfield is strong. And then the fourth bullet under that says operating expenditures have increased at a sustainable rate. Um, and I tripped over that when I wrote it. And now I'm really tripping over that because it's not really sustainable. I mean, last year we were scraping all the pots we could find to fund the basic capital things that we needed to do. And then here we are this year looking at a prop two and a half override. So I think that probably needs to be reworded or decreased just or take it out, take it out entirely. Perfect. I could just take out that whole, well, I want to say though, the impact, if you'd have the impact of inflation, I mean, our operating expenditures actually declined over the past two years. It's fine historically, cool. but I hate to present this to the public now with the situation we're in. And they're gonna, so, they're, yeah. gonna, they're gonna think, oh, everything's wonderful when it doesn't appear it's going to be wonderful. Instead of a um, value judgment term like sustainable, how about just giving the numbers? Have it increased at a rate of blank percent? It, it's not sustainable because our, you know, as a percentage of the budget, school costs are going much faster than municipal costs. And municipal costs can't be compressed anymore. That's, I mean. Well, the first half of that's not true. The second half of that is. <laughs> I mean, the schools aren't increasing any more than the, the municipal is as a percentage. As a dollar value, it's, I mean, it's such a high percentage of our, our um, budget that, you know, the, the extra half a percent or whatever that they ask for extra 1% is, is a huge amount of money compared to the extra three or 4% that the municipal budget might be. All right. So I'm going to move that, that bullet down to a area of concern rather than a positive area. I'm going to say operating expenditures have increased at a rate of whatever the percentage is, um, and include that impact of inflation. Other than that, is anybody? You might want to say, because we don't know yet, we might want to say based on that review so far, it's here's what it is. Because we don't really, we don't know for sure what's going to happen. With, with no, but this is looking back. This is from the financial indicator. So looking at 2022. I know, but when you're going to move it to areas of concern, if it's worded the same, why would that be a concern? So, because I'm not going to say sustainable rate anymore, I'm going to say at a rate of whatever percent. Okay. Which I guess we have in the thing in front of us. Do we want to change? Except, so. Do we want to change? Do those this? say that still says favorable? Yeah. No, right. Well, I'm, and I'm looking at the, the last part of that statement you say that when you consider inflation operating expenditures have declined over the past two years that's why you had it in the favorable um right yeah, yeah i'm not convinced that's favorable i think that means we can't keep up with the services that we're providing i see yes okay got it i don't know where they it is yeah, whatever. Here it is. All right. So, Julie, um, the uh, is is the formula for operating expenditures? Is that something that's in a, a state um, software package or something? Or how how did it determine that they they were favorable? That was just we decided looking at it. Um, okay. Subject, 
Yeah, it was subjective assessment of the um, finance committee. I can find them. Oh, they're right there. Okay. Um, So I guess what we'll say is this, that total operating expenditures include 30, increase 39%, a straight two and a half percent annual increase would be a 28% overall increase. So it's 10% greater than the straight two and a half percent. That's not, I mean, if you include new growth, that's not crazy, but. Isn't right. it no, we've done really well. We we try really hard. It's just um, Isn't there a nine percent increase somewhere in there. It, it's just we, we, at some point we're not going to be able to cover our operating. Yep. I think we're there. And, and more to the point, the town, the town's people are not going to want to continually increase the operating expenditures. Yeah. It feels like a lot of the already up against the wall. And so even if we're moving a little and it's reasonable, if we're hitting, you know, there's nothing left to move. Yeah. I think that's why it feels on uh on this, uh, less than fifty percent. Would it um well it probably wouldn't it's just another data point, but in that same 10 year period, what was the actual cumulative inflation in the economy. So we actually have those same numbers with inflation included, um, which is not quite the question you asked, but it gets at the same answer. So that gives us an 8% increase if you include inflation in. Um, so in other words, we've been really responsible about trying to manage the budget, but um, it's interesting. This is all great information. It is interesting. So I think what that 8% tells us, if that's a real number, is that if you keep, if you include the impact of inflation, that we've actually increased our budget by 8% in 10 years. which is probably not unreasonable because we've added a couple people. We've, um, in, there's the police budget's gone up quite a bit. Um, a we, of, we've, yeah. A lot of it's non-discretionary. It's just. Yeah, there's new requirements that yeah, we, we don't have a choice. Yeah, I agree. That did that is a nice segue to something I've been meaning to ask, which is, should we? Uh, it's obviously too late in this year's budgeting process, but perhaps next year's. Ask town departments to consider what services they could reduce, if it becomes necessary to cut training expenses. I. I mean, public safety yeah. is a little hard to do justify, but particularly the obviously the the obvious target is the um, school budget. Yes, <laughs> it's basically our budget. Yeah, you know, even a percent off of that is <clears throat> makes the difference between red and black. I, we may end up doing that this year if it goes to where we're going to go, and we're in the hole and we don't want to go for a prop two and a half override, we may go back. And we've done that before. We did that a couple of years ago, right? We got to the end and we looked at that and we said, okay, what can we reduce? And right. went back and looked at the budget and yes. asked the select board to go back and cut stuff. So.
All right. Um, so I don't feel like this is ready to be published until I try and reword that and then give you the final rewording and see if you guys agree, right? Yes, I, I also okay. I think that the uh, bar graphs on this page are very hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Even though I know what they say, they're kind of hard to understand. What does the O column represent? Oh, so that is, um, these are total ex operating expenditures and constant dollars. So this includes the impact of inflation. So this is the percent change from last year with inflation considered. Okay, so in 2022, the percent increase was negative. Yes, and in 21. And we haven't projected for 23 yet because we don't know. Yeah, because we don't have a dollar value. And we don't have a, um, oh, we don't have an inflation rate for 20 yeah. yet. It's going to be higher. Yeah. Yeah. Are we still happy with favorable on this indicator? No. No. Take a vote. Which which indicator? Operating expenditures. Operating expenditures number okay. six. Yeah. Well, I I think historically it's okay. Looking back through 2023, but what we're looking at for 2024 goes in the opposite direction. So if you want to just you know, put on blinders for this year, it's favorable is okay. So actually, if we look at the personnel, if you look at the last bullet on that financial, on the executive summary, we say that personnel was favorable because it was looking backward, but because of the changes that have been made, we're putting it as a concern. So we could say the same thing about operating right. expenditures exactly. where looking back, it seemed okay. But, and so we leave the favorable because it only goes through 22. If, I mean, if I feel like I'm, I sound like I'm arguing for that and I'm open to discussion and feedback <laughs> Well, it's hard to know where the expenses are going to end up for fiscal 23, really, in the end. You could have you could have people at a high um, wage rate quit and then us not fill that position. Or, I mean, right. there's so much that can happen yet in fiscal 23 right. that I think it's hard to predict what, what that's going to look like. We don't really know. No. no. But I think it would be misleading to make everybody think. Everything's hunky dory. Where does capital fit with this? That's outside of OE, isn't it? Yeah. And what about putting into the capital stabilization fund? Is that outside of OE as well? Yes. Yep. Okay. It is. Which we didn't do last year. We took out instead. So. And the year before. Okay. Wait a minute. All right, so. All right, so I, I guess I will move that the operating expenditures bullet point on the financial indicators executive summary be moved to an area of concern. I'll second that. All right. Any discussion? In our language, is that marginal or unfavorable? Marginal. Okay. If we're looking at operating expenditures, operating expenditures comes from that report that has our entire budget in it, in it. and that entire budget includes capital. It does? Okay. If it includes and unless I deducted it, it out, does, there, I'd have to look at it. But that we, for this, this report here, 
Um, is it not in there? It's not in there because if you look up here, this total expenditures includes it. We subtract debt and warrant articles. Okay. And then this, I'm pretty sure right. is, yeah, it's okay. that excluding debt and warrant articles adjusted for inflation. So it's just operating. Then it is. Right. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you, Thank you Julie. I need to get this straight in my mind. I need to send you some notes for those things so that I remember from one year to the next. Um, do we want so to change our rating of this from favorable to something else? We have a motion, right? Well, well that no, that's just on the executive right. summary, but right. Um, well, that but that was fun. I <laughs> didn't I hear that we don't really know what twenty twenty three is going to look like. To, yeah. And and are you addressing that in here sort of by sitting by making an obvious statement, but that you know you know, we don't know don't have it fixed yet, but up to the up till now things seem to be okay. So I'm just wondering whether we're getting ahead of ourselves. So, well, but looking issue. forward, I mean we're adding <clears throat> we're adding positions this year. We're going to be adding more positions in the future, none of which are cheap. <laughs> so even if people, even if we get lower paid people in, you know, for some of the higher paying positions, we're still adding positions, which. Hopefully those people will stay for a long time and continue to work for us. No, what we really want. <laughs> or or you can go for positions. an entire year with one person in a department that usually is two and a half people, which was yeah. what happened here. Yeah. But then you know, the library is adding a position, so it wants to. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to need more police. And is marginal supposed to mean neutral? I mean, you have three three flavors. Is there a missing flavor? Or is... <laughs> so marginal is there's some area of concern. Well, that sounds about right. So maybe we should use marginal property expenditures also. And Move the paragraph down. Okay. Forward. So I have a motion. Well, you know, can we well, table your first motion right, and then? Yes. Um... <laughs> okay. So let's do this one first. So operating expenditures. Um, you want to move that we change that to more? Okay. Well, on the uh, on the chart. Right? Yeah. I move that we take operating expenditures as item six on the financial indicated dashboard and we label it as margin. We have a second. Any discussion? Uh, second. That's it already. Don't need to wait. Sorry. All right, any discussion? No, all those in favor? That's four against, one abstain, one, four, one, one. Our motion on the report. All right. All right. Should not. Look at that. You made it like that uh, conditional formatting. Oh. You like that? Huh? It worked. <laughs> All right. So then on our report, um, I don't think we need a motion. I'll just I'll move it down. I'll rewrite something and I'll bring this right up yes. back next meeting. Yeah, to, we'll, to vote, we'll vote on the report. As okay. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask about is if you go on to the next page, we have a draft finance committee annual report. Did, did um, you change that from the last one? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Because I went through the last one. Um, so the stuff that I changed is, um, I'll show you in just a sec. Okay. So it has an introduction paragraph, which kind of says what we do and how we do it. Then we have verbatim this executive summary, which I'll change when we change the executive summary, except I added, um, if you look on the second page, the last two bullets of the top section are in italics, that. if you see them yep. there. Mm -hmm. um, so so I added two more bullets Ooh, and I just made this up. So argue with it. Um, I said the town does not adequately fund building maintenance and replacement of aging equipment because we're not putting enough money into capital and we're not maintaining the things that we do. And then I added school budgets are a large percentage of the overall town budget despite decreasing enrollment. 
and state support of schools has not kept pace with expenses or state mandates. Um, Which one are you? Is this what you I'm in the finance committee annual report. On the I don't second know if page. I sent it to you today, but I handed it to you. It's lying right there. So dig through that third page, probably second page, that, that page right there. Okay. In the middle one. All right. Back of that, there's two bullets in italics. And I put those as areas of concern that warrant attention during the budget review process. Is it not adequately funding building maintenance kind of subjective? Yeah, it is. Matter, <laughs> matter of opinion. Huh? Yeah, that's my opinion. I put it down as my opinion. So I'm like, you guys argue with it. Well, if you don't think it's true, I don't know about building maintenance, but for the aging equipment, we have, you know, capital requests that come through that we're just simply not funding. So that's not, in my opinion, subjective, at least on the on the equipment side. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking today, we replace. We replace a cruiser every year. We buy a cruiser every year. And if you look at Kevin's equipment, we don't replace a piece of Kevin's equipment every year. And he's got a lot more than five vehicles. Doesn't necessarily get the mileage on it, but they get a lot of use. Um, and I, I don't feel like we're. Yeah, but he doesn't have five dump right trucks. We have five cruisers. It's I think it's that trucks, I think it's that I think it's apple. It's that pieces of different it's apples and oranges, though. Comparing. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, he's got a 32 year plan that we're objectively behind on. And as we keep deferring it, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to burn that down eventually. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know what behind on it. Oh, I've, I've seen behind. I've seen the plan. It's a great plan. Yeah. And and what well, also Kind of sucks is that that plan because it's a thirty-two year plan can accurately factor in escalating costs. You know, so like we we didn't know ten years ago that inflation was going to be nuts this year for the things that are on this year's plan or mm -hmm. the plan. So yeah, it's it's uh it's it's definitely behind you know on on his plan. Yeah. You guys are like, yeah, go for it. Like, I'm a little, um, I don't know this sentence about school budgets are a very large percentage of the overall town budget. Totally agree with that. Of course, they are. Oh, the despite decreasing despite enrollment decreasing doesn't have anything to do with that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, and and continues to rise okay. despite and continues. Yeah, you're right. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It was a very long day today. <laughs> right. And I'm also, I don't know how fair is not the right word, but I, I think I'd be careful um, about that if you're not making comparisons with the overall percentage increase in other parts of our municipal budget. I'm not sure if you're yeah. trying to draw so that comparison, did, but okay. We, I mean, we all know school budget is the main thing that we do for good reason. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're, and, and yet, and we'll definitely have some decreasing enrollment, um, but I guess I just wasn't sure what the point was. Um, it, it, it means several people who are being served, but the school budget does not leave us much room for other stuff. It continues no, to, continues right. to be a large percentage. Yeah, it continues to be a large percentage right. despite yeah. decreasing. Right. I, I, so why are we stating it? I mean, of course it is. Yeah. So, so I guess what I mean, the point we're trying to make here, um, I'm not sure what we're trying to say. If we do want to just point that out to the town that, that the school budget is a big part of the budget, then fine. Is it increasing but, at a rate that's faster given our students are declining? Is that where we're going? Um, yeah, I don't so know. it's not it's not they've done a pre so they're not increasing much they've had years where they haven't increased at all and when they do increase they don't usually increase more than two and a half three percent something like that so they you know as far as 
the like, don't go more than two and a half percent a year push that we have, they do a good job. The problem is they're doing it for a lot fewer students than they did six years ago. But a lot of their costs are fixed. A lot of them are fixed, but I mean, the you can't I do much with personnel. I mean, that's the problem. And we also have a high, high um, special ed rate that is not reimbursed, you know, by the state. Um, can, can I just mention, we're going there, and I think there was something on the agenda about school choice. Or was that on next week? I don't have anything about school choice. Okay. I, I, I had hoped that we as finance committees in all the towns and the select boards in all the towns would support looking at the what school choice is doing. The problem is when school choice, you know, Waitley and Conway have smaller amount of kids going into Frontier, have a high, higher percentage of school choice. But our students, Sunderland and Deerfield, have, you know, fairly either increasing or fairly stable numbers going into Frontier. And as a result, our percentage of the budget is going up. Like Brenda was talking about earlier, the overall frontier budget is is a certain amount, not not really a great increase, but our proportion of the budget is increasing by a lot. And the reason why, when you send single digit number of kids from an elementary school to frontier, our numbers are gonna go up. Our percentage of how much we pay of the budget. So we need to look at that formula that's based on the rolling um, enrollment coming from resident kids because the proportion of school choice kids at Frontier is going up higher and higher. And so we're, I mean, Deerfield is basically, Frontier is educating the county and we're picking up a larger percentage of that. So let me just um, jump off on that. So where I was, um whatever the word is triggered about this thing not triggered in that way but triggered to think about it is that on, on something you wrote about questions yeah for next year that's where you, yeah, yeah. yeah there was something on here about coordination of school choice impact and i just wanted to say something because i'm not going to be here so if i could just get this up, yeah, yeah that absolutely for the elementary school night but there's a lot of this misinformation that get with some I'm terrible with names but Last year at town meeting, somebody got up and, and started talking about school choice. Matt Russo. Yeah, he didn't understand that. Matt Russo, yeah. And, and I, I told him the school was going to respond, and they didn't, and we moved on. But he, his basic sort of argument was, it's very fuzzy math. He was basically saying, this is how much it costs per student to educate, right? He took the number of students in the school, and he and divided that, and put that into the budget and got a per student cost and said, why are we spending this much money? to educate choice students when they're only contributing $5,000 to the budget. And I just need people to understand, I'm sure you all do, but let me just put it out there, that the school committee, um, you know, if you have a class room, if you have, if you have a, you know. It's the incremental cost of one more student, right. not it's helpful. the to total all. cost of one it, more student. Because if right. you take away the student, you don't take away. Yeah. We're not the gonna, building or the principal. Well, it's more than that. If we have if we have thirty kids in a grade, everybody in this town is going to want that in, to have two teachers, not one. So then you're going to have fifteen in that grade, and so those are the classrooms that we put choice kids in, right? Because we're already going to have two teachers for that thirty student grade, called second grade. So you can put five more kids in each class through school choice. That's bringing money in. But those costs are the same. So I just, it just was a bug in my V when, it's, you know, you can't come and say we're spending $70,000 a kid, so we should get rid of all these choice kids because they're only bringing in five. Because right. there are certain. Um, because but where it hits you, though. Choice kid to start the third. You're, exactly. Yeah. You're, not, yeah. you're feeling, and that's why they yeah. go through a, an it's annual like, sort of analysis to say, okay, how many spots are we going to open up? So. All right, sorry. But, but once once you have the school choice child there, yep. you can't say no to them, right? So, to go to so in some True. classroom, they might end up causing it to spill over and 
I mean, not, not probably not very often, but right. occasionally it might require another teacher because we have the school choice kids. Right. Um, but the it, other it, thing, it, it, go ahead. Sorry, but just quickly. So we don't really have that kind of immigration into town that is going to okay. make that abrupt change to a classroom size. Okay. And the other thing people should know is that when we as a committee, and I think Trevor was there when, when we did this, we actually cut a grade. Well, cut one class, class. We cut a whole grade classroom out of our grade. You know, we used to have three, say, first grade classes. We chopped a classroom because there were too many choice kids in it. And then that right? ripple so, effect. So the analysis was done. The ripple effect was very difficult for the school because that then, when all those kids went into, say, second grade, you still Teacher had three had teachers. Teacher so there's all kinds of stuff. Work. Some teachers liked it. They got a little, well, no, do something yeah. different. And I'm sure it was very difficult for the administration. But in terms of a fiscal mm -hmm. responsibility sort of viewpoint, they're looking to do that. There, again this there year. was, you know, okay. that analysis was done. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So one other thing that happens, though, is that like Deerfield elementary school makes that decision based on the kids in Deerfield elementary school. Right. So does, <laughs> so does Conway, so does Sunderland. Right. So then when you get to frontier, some town has six kids in a grade and gets 12 or 15 yeah. school choice kids in to fill out that classroom in that grade. When they get to frontier, you add those kids to Sunderland to, you know, whatever. And you start yeah, if, to get yourself into a situation. If, if there are schools that are doing that, for instance, if you're saying like uh, Waitley doesn't have enough kids for a classroom, right. six native kids. And, yeah. Um, they're pretty, bringing in 12. It's and so then in that scenario, would it Waitley only pay, pays a six kid proportion exactly. instead of just a Waitley? And they've gotten accepted all these. That's what Carolyn is saying is that they've accepted all these other school choice kids. So when you get to Frontier, that's you have nice an extra however many classrooms of kids because they all add up from all the towns. So it's really our calculation on how we split up the Frontier costs that could be readdressed. Don't get onto you a little bit different because you're not dealing with grade classrooms, you're dealing with, you know, right, yeah, 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 offering, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, so, there, there's advantages to having a bigger high school because you get more, more classes, yeah. but it's but you can still too. just go back to calculating the four towns separately in a different manner, yeah, but probably the only town that would want to do that, is probably, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a it might be a question for Darius though at the um, frontier meeting. Well, uh, the problem is we're not adequately funding OPEB. We're, we're, you know, that's not happening. And then the retirement and all that kind of stuff, all those fringe benefits, are not adequately apportioned to the town based on the rolling enrollment. It's, I'm just saying that the formula, how how the how the percentage is paid by the towns of, of the frontier budget it needs to be someone, you know, so it's not political. Of course, it, obviously it's going to be, but the, the higher percentage of the budget is being paid for by Deerfield and Sunderland and going forward. And that, you know, that's why our budget, what is our share of the frontier budget is so much more than what the overall budget is. And that's only gonna get worse. It's not sustainable. And, you know, I don't really feel that we should be educating the county, you know. Well, well wait a minute, why do you say that it's gonna get worse? I mean, okay. because Because the, the projected numbers coming from Waitley and Conway are lower. Okay, but then we're not educating the county. So I, I had thought, we are because they're taking a whole bunch of yeah, school choice the, kids yeah. in. So I had, she's not talking about the four towns that feed into Frontier. She's talking about the choice students from around. Mm -hmm. Right, there are in our elementary schools who then feed up to Frontier. So, I so okay. Wait a minute. So uh, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding. So a kid from say, I don't know, Montague. Montague. Well, let's pick a town that's not part of Frontier's. Right, Montague. Montague. Okay, Montague. Could go to <laughs> Waitley Elementary yes. and then frontier. feed from there into Frontier. It right. definitely do feed into Frontier yeah. from there. Yeah, right. 
Yep, they automatically. Because they're guaranteed to go to Frontier if they're in. You're, if you are at one of the elementary schools, you're guaranteed into Frontier. But I, I think I had asked this question and the because I was I was concerned, well, is Deerfield picking up the tab for all those? In, incidentally, we do in a way, but um, but it isn't the, the, the I think the Waitley is assessed to those kids. So or say Waitley brings in a bunch of kids from all over. It's not Deerfield paying that fee for right. those kids, but there is the the indirect cost, right, of having all those kids, the buildings, the school, the lunches, the I, I all the other yeah, things saw, around that. But I could be wrong about that. I thought I thought I thought what Carolyn's saying is that in fact those uh, Waitley is not paying for those kids in the frontier. So I think they are. They are. Because I they thought different I thought that was the question. I was my uh, I was under the impression it's based on the the address of the kids. I posed okay. that to, to and there was a rolling enrollment. It's a five year rolling enrollment. Maybe but I'm I, wrong, but my when I have been asking talking about it in the previous years, it it seems like Deerfield's percentage has been going is creeping up because we don't have we don't contribute as much to the school choice kids as as you know Waitley's numbers. That. Right, they're getting charged. Yeah. 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 Get yep. the, get the, and then um, let's go back to. Um, can I interrupt real quick? We're just going to adjourn. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is done, then we'll get, get out of your hair. <laughs> and we should, and when we, and when we look at the school budgets, when we talk about them next week, we can ask, you For know, sure. and get this clarified, because you know I think it's important to look at, you know, long term. Again, it's about sustainability, and that's all I'm talking about. Yep. So um, we're going to skip over a couple of items, and we'll we'll meet next next meeting on those. Um, entertain a motion to adjourn for the select board. I will make that motion. And I will second that. All those in favor? Tim Helchi, aye. Kevin McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you all very much. Appreciate all right, it. All right. Thanks, Nick. Right. Good, Good night. night. Good night. The summary of the financial indicators that can wait for as long as we want to, so that we don't have to do this draft finance committee annual report. The deadline is like March 13th or something. I'm out of town next week and will not be at any of our meetings. Uh -oh. um, so I guess we can review it. I'll, I'm just going to be late. We'll review it March 13th. I'll put a revised version out. Um, I'll Wait, are you not being at the school meetings? I will not be at either school meeting. Sorry. Um, okay. so, I'm going to miss one of the two meetings. Right here. Okay. I hope I'm not going to um, you. Congratulations. <laughs> You're sitting closest. It's, it must be you. Yeah, this doesn't matter. We go I'm not going to be here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So okay. I will put a revised version of this out as well. We will vote this at the March 13th meeting, and I will email that to um, go ahead. Pat. Okay. Um, I just had one yeah comment on your third bullet on the front page. We have healthy reserves in our general fund, but on your executive summary, it says and stabilization funds. And I think I think oh. you'd want to include the stabilization funds in that line item. So I actually changed that on purpose. Oh, okay. I don't think we have healthy reserves in the capital stabilization funds well, because it's not enough money to cover what we need to do. Right. But we do have another stabilization fund, which is healthy. So- which one your general is stabilization? Our general stabilis. Oh, you're right. So I'm um, in our general healthy words. I think you know it's say. that's. I think that's healthy. General stabilization. Capital I just stabilization. Left out the word maybe stabilization. not stabilization. Yeah. Okay. So I'll add stabilization back in and take capital out. Thank you. Okay. I got you. Any other comments on what's written there that we ought to change? Um, I'm email you. You make it sound better. <laughs> Can you do it just um like track changes instead of putting comments? Yeah, sure. That'd be better because I end up just typing all of your comments in anyway. It'd be a lot easier just to accept the change. So <laughs> it always sounds better when you. Okay. Any other comments on those two things? Um, we have our list of questions. 
Next week for the school committee, what's going to happen next week? We have the two school committee meetings on Tuesday and Thursday. I posted a meeting so we can be joint so that we can have discussion among ourselves if we want to. We're not going to vote the budgets at those meetings. We will vote the budget hopefully on the 13th. Um, yeah, hopefully you'll bring me copies or email me copies so I can plug it in. Yeah, so th that we they were. We we're supposed to ask for copies in advance. Are they not giving us copies in advance? No, I have no idea. Okay, okay, I'll ask Casey. Are yeah, we okay. but I but I have not seen. No, anything. at the it's at the schools. At the schools. Yeah. So, uh, so I posted a high school break. And it's just a education experience. No voting, right? Right education no pun intended so we don't even need to i mean like if you don't have a quorum don't don't open the meeting we just won't have it right still ask questions yeah i'm not sure why i just don't know anything about the tv okay so don't have a meeting you won't have the two of the minutes there you go um oh, okay they know how to do it. Okay. does anybody have questions for board of health select board that we need to add to this list okay. of questions. No. Okay, I think that's it. Make a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much, everybody. I have a motion to put heat in the building. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>